I hereby call the Finance Committee for Monday, November 18th. It being time, Constance, before we get into the uh, agenda, I am going to read out of respect and, and thank you. Mayor Rodriguez is here. Um, celebrating Brockton City Hall. Brockton City Hall is 125 years old. 1894 to 2019, Mayor Moises Rodriguez cordially invites you to the City Hall 125th Gala, Saturday, December 14, 2019, 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. here at City Hall, 45 School Street. Music, cocktails, and community. Ticket price $50. $50. It can be purchased here at City Hall in the Mayor's office or on, on the uh, Ventbrite semi-formal black tie optional. Black tie optional, Mr. Cruz. Optional. <laughs> optional. Um, so duly note that, please. And with that being said, also, uh, we want to recognize our three new colleagues. Um, we have the Ward 5 Counselor Je Attorney Jeffrey Thompson. Thanks for being here, Counselor B. <coughs> Two Counselors at Large, Attorney Rita Mendez, Counselor at Large, Tina Cardoza. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> that being said, Madam Clerk, agenda item number one, please ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Farnham Street, extending from the end of the 1965 layout northerly, a distance of about 438 feet, more or less, and for the purpose it is necess necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Mr. Commissioner, good evening. Good evening, Councillors. Um, we have no objections for this request. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Councillor Lally, please. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, before all of these start, first of all, thank you, Commissioner Rally, for uh, for helping us out. Uh, and, <clears throat> and this, these, along with the rest of the roads that we've done, uh, all this is is making it into a, a public street. Uh, this doesn't start a, a clock or a timetable to pave the road. It doesn't come with any money attached. But uh, it's, you know, the people who live on these private ways pay the same taxes as everyone else. Uh, this is about, you know, making sure that they've got the same treatment. Um, you know, that's, that's just my logic for, for filing them. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Just for procedural, these are public hearings, so I will, uh, I will open the public hearing. I know uh, the Commissioner spoke in favor of it. Anyone else here in the Chamber in favor of this? Any neighbor, any resident in favor of this? Third and final time. Uh, are you? If you want to go on the record, you just need to come and state your name. <laughs> you don't want to go on the record? All right. Well, we'll just note that there's one person here in the audience in favor. Third and final time, anyone here in favor? Do you want to state your name for the record? Yeah, I, I favor the motion. Again, sir, if you could just state your name and your address. Uh, Raymond L. Ferry, 12 Belgian Circle, Brockton, Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anyone else here in favor? Third and final time, that part of the hearing is closed. Anyone here or not? I just have a question. Please come forward. Please come forward to the podium, sir. Your name, please. Uh, Darren Shanks, 22 Haskell Street. Um, just making sure, because um, I know we have some other issues going on on that street. All this is doing is making it so that eventually it can be paved and those issues might be addressed. Council. Um, I, I always like to say, uh, you know, if I, if I can't pull it out of my pro pocket, I'm not going to promise it to you. Uh, so I can't promise, uh, you know, the road being paved short of, you know, I hope it happens before I die. Um, but in, in all seriousness, this is, this is to make it eligible. Right now, it's a private road. It's not possible. Um, this will not add any additional length to the road. You know, nobody's going to put... I know that's you know not the case for Haskell, but you know Belding and Farnham, nobody's going to add anything to it. It's just going to you know you're going to wake up the next day and it's going to look the same, feel the same. It'll just be a, a public city street. Uh, that is also an area that's being focused on uh, so by they were by connected, some. So I yeah. just I hope no, but I so. I will uh, I'll I'll catch you uh, afterwards and I'll, I'll make sure you have my cell and we can talk further about the uh, the actual paving of the road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shanks. Anybody else here? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here in the chamber in opposition? Third and final time, the part of the hearing is closed. Councillor, like to take uh, a motion. Moved to recommend favorably. Second. Motion on the floor is properly second. Favorable. Back to the full council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion <coughs> carries. Favorable. Back to the full city council. Number two, please. 
ordered that the common necessity and mm. convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Belding Circle, extending from Farnham Street westerly to Belding Circle Extension, a distance of 590 feet more or less. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of C city of Brockton. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Time haven't arrived. I declare the public <laughs> hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, please come forward to state your name. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections for this request. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Anyone else here? Anyone here in the chamber relative to this agenda matter? Third and final time, anyone here in favor? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here in opposition? Third and final time, that part of the hearing is closed. Councilor Lally. Move to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion on the floor is properly second. Favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you oppose, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable back to the full council as stated. Madam Clerk, number three, please. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Belding Circle extension, extending from Belding Circle northwesterly, 253.79 feet, more or less, and for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street <laughs> or way of said city of Brockton. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Time having to arrive, I'm going to uh, declare the public hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, kindly state your name for the record. Mr. Commissioner. Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner, and we have no objections for this request. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Anyone else here on this matter in favor? Third and final time, anyone here in favor? That part of the hearing is closed. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here in the chamber in opposition? Third and final time, anyone here in opposition? Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. Councilor Lally. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Motion on the floor was properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation. Back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries, Madam Clerk. Favorable back to the full council. Number four, please. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Haskell Street, extending from Hovenden Avenue northerly to Belding Circle, a distance of about 663 feet, more or less. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Time haven't arrived. I'm going to declare the public hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, kindly state your name. Mr. Commissioner. <laughs> Larry Rowley, DPW Commissioner. And we have no objections for Thank this you. request. Anyone else here in the chamber? Anyone here? Third and final time. Anyone here in favor of this matter? Seeing none, that's part of the hearing's closed. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here in opposition? Third and final time. Anyone in opposition? Part of the hearing's closed. Council Lally. I want to apologize to uh, Commissioner Rowley for making him run up and down so much. Uh, move to recommend favorably. Second. It's motion on the floor. Properly second. Favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. It carries. Favorable back to the full council. Number five, please. Ordered that the common necessity and convenience of the inhabitants of the city of Brockton require the laying out and acceptance of Leahy Road, extending from North Quincy Street easterly to Roslyn Road, a distance of about 1,335 feet, more or less. And for that purpose, it is necessary to take an easement for highway purposes and lay out as a public street or way of said city of Brockton. Invited Lawrence Rowley, DPW Commissioner. Time haven't arrived. The public hearing is hereby open. Anyone here in favor, kindly state your name for the clerk. Commissioner, this is it for you. Number five, you're done. <laughs> DPW Commissioner Lawrence Rowling, we have no objections for this request. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Anyone else here in favor? Third and final time. Anyone here in favor? The part of the hearing is closed. Anyone here in opposition? Anyone here in the chamber in opposition? Third and final time. Anyone here in opposition? Part of the hearing is closed. Council Lally. Move to recommend favorably. Second. Second. There's a motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. Favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. <coughs> Favorable back to the council. Thank council, do you have any more of these council. by the end of the year? <coughs> oh, no. I've decided to show mercy, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank I you, appreciate, I appreciate all your patience. Thank you very much, Councilor. <laughs> no, that's uh, the neighbors appreciate it. Thank you. We'll go on to number six, please. Appointment of Lucia Searcy of 33 Dover Street, Unit 130, Brockton, to the Con Conservation Commission to fill the unexpired term of David Zaff, ending March 2020. Invited, Lucia Searcy. It's Ms. Searcy here. Good evening. <coughs> How are you tonight? Good, thanks. 
Thank you for being in attendance. Do you have a statement for the council? I do. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Mayor Rodriguez and city council members, I want to thank you for your time and dedication to the city and specifically for your attention to my appointment today. My name is Lucia Searcy, and I currently reside at 212 West Chestnut Street. I am 26 years old and have lived most of my life in the city. I was raised attending my father's union meetings, watching him advocate for co-workers as vice president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. I have witnessed him negotiate contracts and stand before corporations, unafraid to do what was right for the people he represented. I look back on those moments and see clearly how my path as a community steward was forged. I enjoy educating myself on city matters and social causes, volunteering for as many Brockton-based organizations as my schedule sees fit. Several of those roles have allowed me to network with a variety of different stakeholders in our community and serve a wide range of citizens. It is through my commitment to Brockton that I stand before you today as a candidate for the Conservation Commission. I've coordinated programs and mentored teens at the Boys and Girls Club and for the Gateway to College program at Massasoit. I was selected under the late Mayor Carpenter to be a part of an advisory committee tasked with drafting the Downtown Action Strategy. Most recently, I have become the new president of Brockton Arts, Inc., helping to coordinate programs and manage two gallery spaces in the city. In my spare time, I help facilitate music and art showcases, highlighting our community's talent through an organization called Brockton Mag. The Conservation Commission is an important vessel for directing Brockton towards a greener future. I understand as a commissioner, I am expected to be collaborative, forward-thinking, and an active resident in the city, fostering overall growth and development. My duty will be to protect our natural resources by enforcing the Wetlands Protection Act and participating in creating new green space initiatives. I recognize the gravity of this responsibility and affirm to each one of you today my commitment to stewarding our city as a member of the Conservation Commission. I am proud of the seeds that I have sown in Brockton and have no plans of leaving the city. I look forward to continuing my work alongside you and learning all I can from your footsteps. Thank you kindly for this opportunity. I'm deeply appreciative of your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Searcy. Just before we have any questions, just I just was 33 Dover Street a previous address? No, that's actually where um, Brockton Arts is that's located. That's where the Arts is. Yes. That's the old Stacy Adams, right? Yes. Okay. What, what's the correct address for you? I'm sorry. 212 West Chestnut Street. Madam Clerk, if we could just duly note that for a Scrivener's error. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your statement. Any questions, Councils? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion on the floor is properly seconded. It's a favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. It's favorable back to the full council. So we'll vote a final vote at the next council meeting. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Have a good evening. Much. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, number seven, please. Order that sections 26B to 26E, inclusive of chapter 111 of the Massachusetts General Laws, be and hereby is accepted by the City of Brockton in accordance with section 26A of chapter 111 of the Massachusetts General Laws. Invited, Philip Nasrallah, City Solicitor, Mary Brophy, MD, Chairperson, Board of Health Commission, Megan Bridges, Assistant City Solicitor. Councilors, before we get into that agenda item, I do want to recognize our, uh, our colleagues in, in government uh, from the school committee, attorney and vice chairman of the school committee, Tom Minicello is here, uh, school committee member Mark D'Agostino, school committee uh, woman, Judy Sullivan, and of course our superintendent of the schools, Mike, Mike Thomas. Thank you, thank you for being here. Sorry I didn't see you earlier. Um, with that being said, we'll go on to the invited guest, please. Number seven. Attorney Nazarella, good evening. Good evening. Attorney Bridges. Dr. Brophy, good evening. Who wants to speak on this? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I should start with a hello. Thank you for having me. And are there any specific questions you want to start with? I don't necessarily have a prepared statement, but I am sort of uh, intimately familiar with what's before you, so I'm able and happy to speak on <coughs> any and all of it. Thank you, Attorney Bridges. Uh, Consuls, who wants to speak first? 
Councillor Lodge, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, having read this um, this document, uh, um, I I understand the overall concept of of trying to unify certain different departments in the city, um, but I'm a little concerned about. Um, one, we're not actually accepting the Mass General Law to accept to create the uh, to the to create the position of Human Services uh, Director of Health and Human Services because we have changed in the uh, Home Rule petition the wording a little bit, and one of my first concern on, on the document is whether we are dictating in our Home Rule petition that it will be led by an MD with um, some sort of um, public health experience as as the state as the uh, mass general law indicates i think so let's take a quick step back then maybe i'll just offer a few words on sort of the outline of the proposal and what's in front of you tonight is specifically acceptance of mass general laws only sections i think it's 26 b through e or 26 a through e my apologies on that um also filed B, B through E. Okay, thank you. So B through E. Also filed with that was a special, a special act relative to deviations of uh, certain conditions of the statute, as Councillor McGarry just noted for us, as well as comprehensive ordinances that <clears throat> um, revitalize and revamp the Board of Health uh, within the city of Brockton. So. All of these things were filed at one time. The only thing that's in front of you right now is the acceptance of the statute. So if you take action, if any action is taken on acceptance of the statute, what will happen is the current three-member Board of Health would be abolished and supplanted, sup, supplanted, not supplemented, because it would be totally separate, with a nine-member Health Advisory Commission <clears throat> and then a Commissioner on Public Health. And a little bit of background, uh, after the sad passing of Mr. Tartaglia, the city became aware of the restrictions of the executive authority in appointing the head of the Department of Health. So uh, in essence, the city has control right now over the members of the Board of Health, the three-member board, of which Dr. Brophy is a member. And uh, the board directs the actions of the department. Um, so some problems arise with that. Number one is what we're dealing with now, where there's an interim individual in there who um, does not appear to possess the qualifications to run the department. Um, and then also that the three-member board, they meet uh, at their regularly scheduled meetings, but they're not in the office day-to-day -day running the Board of Health. So what acceptance of these statutes does is transfer essentially the policy and regulatory making power from the three-member board to a, an, a department head or a commissioner of public health. <clears throat> so, and then um, what would also be part of this big picture is I mentioned that comprehensive ordinances were filed alongside of this um, <clears throat> statute acceptance. And the ordinances would create in a linear fashion um, a line of departments that be that would be um, sent that would be under the commissioner of public health instead of just independent individual individual departments. For example, um, weights and measures is uh, suggested to become under this commission of health and human services, and uh, you know maybe oh why is the why is the weights and measures part of health and human services? Well, it's really a human service function. It might not be a health function, but when you go to the gas pump and it sets at zero and you see um, who used to be Mr. Coyne's name on there, now sometimes you see Corey Quinlan and then the other gentleman's escaping me. But uh, you know, you, you wanna know, oh, if I don't see this set at zero, who do I call? Who can I talk to about this? You know, and then if you're not satisfied with the answer from the weights and measures, who's their boss? So all of those types of thoughts are part of the considerations of the comprehensive health and human services to, as, along with uh, a board of health. Um, I, I made a chart I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry about that. But um, we'd have a human services department, 
Um, we would have the Veterans Affairs would come under there, Public Health Division, Weights and Measures, Elder Affairs, all these departments that are very, that exist already, but they don't exist in any fashion. They don't report to anyone except for the mayor. And a lot of times the heads of these departments are not, um, <coughs> are not a, a, appointed. They're <coughs> unionized positions and they're voted in by a board. So in direct response to Councillor McGarry's question, um, state law specifically sets out the qualifications for the Commissioner of Public Health. It should be known that the City of Brockton Board of Health functions much like a town Board of Health. A lot of cities that have comparable populations to Brockton have migrated to this Commission for Health and Human Services because of the comprehensive uh, services and functions it can provide to the city. Board of Health were created in order to provide actual health services to populations that either didn't have access to doctors or in times where there was a city physician who made house calls. Like I mentioned to Mr. McGarry, I remember getting my own immunizations at a Board of Health when I was young. But that's not what Board of Health do these days. Board of Health write policy, they care about disease control, they care about health and sanitation, um, you know, smoking, which is certainly a health aspect, but um, record keeping, um, things like that. It's, it's a comprehensive function that's not just focused on health. So the, the statute, uh, I believe it's 111, it's B or C, it specifically sets out the qualifications for who can run the department. I believe Mr. McGarry is asking what the deviations are from what the statute says and what the, what would the proposal was. <clears throat> At the risk of, or I don't want to confuse anyone because what's in front of you tonight is not the city, is not the ordinances and it's not the special act. What's in front of you tonight is acceptance of the general laws, abolishing the Board of Health, and then embarking on the process of designing the department as the city sees fit from there forward. That you have been provided suggestions via the way of the ordinances and the special act, but right now, the way that the statute reads is the commissioner of public, the, who runs the department, would need to be a medical doctor mm -hmm. with also a degree in public health or public administration and then years of experience on top of that. So very succinctly, the deviation that's proposed, that's not in front of you right now, but is the special act that was already filed, combines those qualifications. You can be either an MD or a, uh, have a degree in public health or public administration with the years of experience. So you don't need the MD and the other secondary advanced degree. Is that responsive? That, that answers, and I wanted that, and, and granted this, this is, um, is just accepting the Mass General Law in the city, but when this came before the council, if you recall, I, at that time I had asked, I had made the point that I didn't feel it was appropriate for us to discuss until we had all pieces before us because one is, once this is accepted, then the, the intent obviously is, is for this, which is um, the, the change, the ordinance and the home rule petition, mm -hmm. which would come after we accept this. Um, I imagine the intent would be to start the process, but the Board of Health does not stops, it, uh, does not cease to ex exist until the commissioner would be appointed and the uh, Public Health Board, uh, Advisory Board, is all appointed. Um, uh, until that time, you would still have a Board of Health in place, which at this point, uh, you're, you're coming to the end of the fiscal year, everything's gonna have to be refiled after the beginning of the year. Anything that dies in, in committee or in, on the council now will have to be refiled in January. So you're looking at you know, possibly a few months. So um, at this point, I, I, I personally, I'm still not happy that we don't have the entire, entire package in front of us to be discussed because she, uh, the, the attorney is completely correct that uh, what is before us tonight is very simple, and I agree, if we're going to do it, I agree with what the Mass General Law says. Um, the setting of the commissioner with, with the requirements, the, the, uh, the, the uh, qualifications that are requested, and the setting up of the board, the advisory board. Um, that is fine. The question comes when that, when that piece comes before you to change it, to change the hierarchy to who can, be, who can hold that position, 
uh, what the department head qualifications are going to be and such. That is going to be incumbent upon whoever sits here after the first of the year. And I'm very happy to know that there's another RN here with a lot of experience um, that will understand a lot of what's, being, what's going on. Um, and uh, I certainly offer up my services th uh, through the chair to her um, after the first year if she has any questions or wants any help from me. But um, what you're looking at is totally changing how we provide services in the city of Brockton. And I, I talked to both Newton and to Worcester today um, because they both have, have this in place. Um, and there are pros and cons to everything. Um, and I certainly don't, don't have any problem if, if the proper people are, the qualifications are proper and the proper people are hired for those positions. So um, I'll yield at this time. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. And just, uh, just for our newly elected officials, just to kind of um, expand, expand upon what Council was saying is, uh, under the procedural two-year term, <coughs> anything that's not passed by the end of the legislative session has to be refiled, has to start fresh again in January. So there's quite a few matters that would, this would be one of them, okay. quite a few that would have to be teed up again. Any other questions? Councilor Farwell, please. Yeah, just to, thank you for the discussion we had today, uh, Attorney Bridges. Is it fair to say that our current mode of operation is more like a town than a city? Is that? In doing the research and in, in drafting what's in front of you, that's my opinion, yes. And either to you or, or Solicitor Nesrala, is it, if, if we accept the provisions of this statute, is it necessary to do a home rule petition or could we not establish rules and regulations and procedures by ordinance? Um, the answer is in the affirmative. You could establish the rules and regs um, via ordinance and you could not deviate from the statutory requirements. Right. <clears throat> As Councillor McGarry said, he spoke to Newton and Worcester today, and those are the two communities whom I reviewed their ordinances in depth and used them for inspiration for what's in front of you, as well as the, or the comprehensive ordinance package and the commissioner of public health, their qualifications. All that information came from Newton and Wellesley, or excuse me, Newton and Worcester, places that are already operating like this. So. You don't need this, the home rule petition. You don't need the special act at all. That was put in place because that's the route that Newton and Worcester took. If you don't take that route, the statute prescribes very specifically the qualifications of who can run the department. That person has to be a medical doctor. They have to have a degree in medicine. They don't have to practice medicine. And they also have to have a degree in either public health or public administration. And then they have to have years of experience that coordinate with their um, the work that they're doing. So no special act is required if the city accepts 111.26b through e um, and intends on forging the path to find a commissioner to run the department who has the qualifications set out by the statute. Okay, so we, I'm pleased you said we don't have to go through the rather rigorous home rule petition route have it passed here, sent into the legislature, have hearings, et cetera, et cetera? Not necessary unless there is a deviation from the requirements of the statute for the position of the commissioner. Okay, well, I, I would say to my colleagues, uh, and I know the mayor has been involved in this, this is an attempt to really move health and human service issues into the 21st century for this city. We have a lot of different populations in the city, they have a lot of different health issues, uh, ranging from senior citizens down to children, lead paint, lead poisoning. Um, I, I might also add, um, you know, the Board of Health, and this is not directed at Dr. Brophy, but in general, our health operation cries out for modernization and for efficiency. Um, and I, I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm going to lay it out here. We've had people put in for reimbursement for inspections they've never done. We have nothing on computer, as I understand it. And Dr. Brophy can, can tell me I'm wrong, but I understand we have nothing on computer. <coughs> and my other understanding is we have one person who does 
I think 111 or 121 restaurant inspections. For whatever reason, we don't have anyone else in the health department that goes out and proactively checks restaurants and makes sure that they're doing what they should be doing in order to protect consumers. So there is a lot of work that has to be done in health and human services in the city. And I think grouping the, the Women's Commission and the Commission on Diversity um, along with veteran services all under the umbrella of a commissioner that shrinks down the mayor's span of control so that he or she can always deal with that one person that has their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the city rather than fragment the effort. But the other big thing, at least to me, is think about the grants that we could apply for. Right now we apply for a grant, we have a Board of Health and that's all they do. Why not expand our, our involvement in health and human service issues so that we can qualify for grants, so that we can bring in money, so that we can do creative things, we can have public education and awareness programs. I, I mean, I think this is a really a golden opportunity to move forward. And, uh, and I hope that it gets a favorable recommendation. Um, and then I think via ordinance, we can do what we need to do to put in place the regulations and the framework that will work best for Brockton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors? Councillor Cruz, please. Thank you. Just a few questions, and I, uh, the, the broad idea, uh, but I, I look in much of what uh, the, the problems we've had in the, in the Board of Health, not the problems, I don't like to even term them that way, are problems of being shorthanded. Uh, we don't, there's not a department in this city that doesn't operate bare bones. The idea of whether whether Dr. Brophy, as the chairman of the Board of, of Health, or whether, let's say, somebody in her position actually had that, that full-time position, those problems aren't going away without adding four, five, six people to the Board of Health. Without adding, you know, those, those are problems of management and not of, of experience in whether we have a, a doctor. Uh, let me ask Dr. Brophy your thoughts on, on these proposed changes. Yeah, so thank you, um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. I've been on the board for over a decade. I serve with Dr. Andre, who is, uh, works with the uh, Department of Public Health in, in Boston, along with uh, Mr. Frisk, who is a uh, funeral director here in the city of Brockton. You know, when I came onto the board several years ago, there were three physicians sitting at the uh, Board of Health. It has been, um, and now I am the only physician sitting at the Board of Health right now. Dr. Andres, however, has a uh, PhD in, in public health, and actually for his PhD thesis, uh, did work on the structure and organizations that uh, Board of Health uh, should have. And recently, I, um, I, you know, as you're pointing out, over the years, the Board of Health has been the area where money could be cut when things were tight in the city of Brockton. We are sorely under-resourced uh, for the amount of people that live in the city. And I think um, more than any other department in this city, I think people in this, or in this uh, chamber should recognize that the Board of Health touches everyone. It inspects your food, it handles your water, it handles your waste, it deals with infection control, it deals with outbreaks, it deals with emergency management. It is a department that is stretched to the limits uh, with the resources that it has, uh, that it has in place. Uh, we have one public health nurse for this entire city. Uh, for years, I've asked for two public health nurses. We've been without an animal inspector for a long period of time. Part of that, because the qualifications for the animal inspector, we cannot find a qualified person in the city of Brockton who can meet that. I want to bring to your attention, and I'm unaware of the full extent of this because the Board of Health has not been involved in the development of this, uh, of this legislation. So when uh, uh, Mr. Tataglia passed away, uh, the board uh, immediately called an emergency meeting, recognizing that uh, the city cannot be without an acting person and put in place the uh, executive assistant with the understanding that we would quickly hire somebody into that position, um, hiring hopefully, as we know, someone with an MPH background, at least an MPH background to, to help us. Because you're right, in the 21st century, it's no longer lead paint, it's lead paint plus tick-borne infections, uh, opioid addiction, smoking epidemic, vaping uh, that are occurring right now. We also do not have the resources <laughs> and computers. 
uh, et cetera, that need to, to be that way. That's not just the city of Brockton, it's the state of Massachusetts. Okay. So there was a review and just recently released in June of 2019, the blueprint for public health excellence that was released by the state of Massachusetts that points out that, the, that this state is one of few states where you still have local control of boards of health, that in most states around the country, there are regional areas that involve because of the expertise that's needed. There's also credentialing that can take place for boards of health. So boards of health can actually be sanctioned as a sanctioned board of health. And this document, which should be reviewed, and you know, if you're making changes to the Board of Health, the Board of Health has expertise in this and can assist in this if asked to do so. And what would be the most effective and efficient mechanism for the city of Brockton to move forward into that 21st century? This is a model that has been put forward. It's a model that's also using what's being uh, uh, adapted is that there should be shared jurisdiction resources across. So what's happening now is that Worcester is not just taking care of Worcester, it's taking care of the area around it by sharing resources with the communities around it. There are a number of networks in the Cape where this happens. Uh, Brockton certainly could be a hub for one of these resources. It's the design of what would be the most effective and efficient for our city in, in, in doing this moving forward. And there are requirements. We have regulations that we have to respond to the Board of Health, also to the Environmental Protection Agency. And those are legal requirements that we have to do, and we have to respond to, that, to, the, to the boards to do that. So, you know, whether this model is the best model for, Bro uh, for Brockton or what would be the best model for Brockton is certainly should be considered, but it's considering putting in place the right operation and plans. Uh, you know, what this uh, blueprint is calling for is an investment to be made in this moving forward in the state of Massachusetts, that we should think about using shared resources, that we should uh, develop uh, uh, plans that are efficient for our own use and, and really moving towards reaching uh, uh, the things that are needed, credentialing, having the high level credentials to be able to take on a job and running public health. Now what you're offering is broader than public health, you're bringing in a number of resources. I'm standing here as a person that's been on the Board of Health for years and my only concern and the concerns of my fellow colleagues on the Board of Health of the City of Brockton, the citizens of the City of Brockton are protected. And with that, you need a background in health to be able to do that. And it's a complex world moving forward. And even though an administrator may not, uh, may be someone with an administrative <coughs> background may be able to take this role, someone with, without a health, without the health background or at least the public health background, I think would uh, do an injustice to, uh, to Brockton. And there is a due diligence in setting this up, of setting up a plan that will be successful for the city of what type of person do we need what type of people do we need to serve under them? How do we reorganize the board to be an effective board moving forward so that we assure that our, our city is uh, given the best opportunity and is safest uh, and uh, meets all the standard requirements with actually a vision of becoming certified as we move forward. And this points out that there is a roadmap to doing this. It is going to take a lot of work moving forward with information technology, even at the state level. The state can't track things easily because of the lack of reporting up to the state. There's uh, systems that need to be put in place, informatic skills that need to be put in place uh, to make this move forward. So my appeal would be in, in this to sort of think about this and broadly think about what will be best for the city and bring in the expertise needed to design that plan before moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Profi. Thank you. Uh, could I just, if the attorney could come up, uh, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but as I read the state law, you mentioned an MD or someone with a public health background. The <coughs> law says you need the um, degree in medicine as well as a degree in public health or public administration. The special act that was filed alongside of the acceptance of the statute and the ordinance melds those things together and says an MD or public health or well, what's in front of us tonight you'd have to be an MD it says eligible to practice medicine so that's sort of why I started out um, the summary with focusing on the fact that there were three three things filed at the same time so in response to your question if there were no action taken relative to a special act then the only ind the individual who would fill the role of the Commissioner of Public Health would have to um, rise to the qualifications that you're reading in the statute. Does that answer you? 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, and that's all that's in front of us tonight. So uh, what's in front of you tonight is acceptance of the statute. Of the statute. It, and the statute says an MD or uh, eligible to practice medicine. That is what it says. Okay, the, stat so. the statute, I think, though, in looking at other communities that have went this route or taken on this model for their vehicle, for their public health departments, um, have not complied directly with the statute. Most, if not all, of the municipalities that I reviewed all deviated from the qualifications of the statute, whether it was because of regional services, like Dr. Brophy just mentioned, or whether it was Newton and Worcester who have looked for, you know, a, a modernization. Um, you know, as we heard Dr. Brophy talk about just now, the focus of this role is on public health, not necessarily <coughs> just medicine. And the way you read the statute, or the way that I read the statute, it's a focus on medicine. So, um, if the role were filled today, it would have it, to be. If we accepted this, it would have to be an MD or, uh, or eligible to practice. I think Dr. Brophy wants to say yeah, something. Yeah, I just want to uh, comment that uh, you know the uh, flu clinics, the clinics that are run here, you need someone with prescriptive authority uh, to be able to do that. So. You know, if there's a PhD running um, Newton's, I believe, or uh, I think there's a nurse practitioner in Quincy, um, you can have a PhD that's in charge of running it or someone with a MPH running it, uh, but they need someone also working with them that has prescriptive authority. So whether you hire, so what it means is you're hiring somebody at the top, but you may have to hire somebody with a license to, uh, to prescribe to be able to, to fulfill the, the needs. So that's why des how you design it, because it can get very, depending on the, uh, the resources or the cost, you have to hire someone with the public health background, but you also have to be able to provide those services <laughs> of, of being able to you know, uh, have the uh, uh, license to prescribe in order to be able to run the things like the flu clinics that are, that are part of the, of the you know, a nurse practitioner or someone with some uh, licensing uh, or prescriptive ability to do that would a be able PA? to do it. Right, uh, well, PA operates under a physician license, but some of the nurse practitioners- but they have prescription, my wife's a PA, they have prescription authority though. Prescription authority yeah. that have to be given to them, yeah, so, okay. And then going back to the attorney, um, you mentioned earlier that some of the problems are, you know, that there, there's union issues and things like that, well, uh, Mr. Tataglia's job right now is in our department heads union, I believe, correct? He is, yes. And so th this would take, even if we accepted this, it would take negotiation with the union? Um, so this, I believe the design would create a job that would be non-unionized, the commissioner of public health, and the person that's the department head who would replace Lou would report to that person. So we still see somebody, okay, so now that gets to me as a Councilor Fowl always jokes with me, I always look at the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So what you pr propose, if we were to do this, is that we would have this new position and we would still replace someone in Mr. Tataglia's level? Yes. So we're now talking about, well in fact, let me ask possibly the mayor, where do you think <laughs> we're gonna, what do you think this job would pay and it would certainly have uh, residency as an issue in the city of Brockton? Uh, <coughs> Does anybody have any idea what this position would pay? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. I'm not, a, uh, I wasn't invited for this particular item, but I think uh, it was something Any that I spearheaded. Any objections to speak, seeing none. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. I, I object. <laughs> but, Any you know, I, I. My questions are, you know, the idea is not poor, but the, the devil's in the details of everything that we do. And. Uh, Council, it is, it is, but one of the things that we were trying to do, what, that we've been trying to do in the city, uh, I think there's a little bit of a confusion. We're not eliminating the, the, the health department. What we're <coughs> doing is basically augmenting what we're doing in terms of health and human services in the city. So the health department itself is not being eliminated. So whatever, whatever inspectors we have, whatever positions right, well, we, we have within that, we can't we'll, that, we'll stay within what they are. It's just that we're, we're tweaking this to move us from a small town mentality into a city, as, and as Council Farwell said, there are millions of dollars that we're losing out in terms of grants that we cannot go after mm -hmm. because we don't have a department set up that actually goes after funding that coordinates all that effort. Uh, right now, the human services is, is being run out of the mayor's office, right. and it <coughs> shouldn't be. 
There should be a department that deals with the issues that we're facing in the community in terms of homelessness, uh, women's issues, and some of the you know, youth services, and some of the other things that that department should be focusing on. And we're not doing that because we don't have a department that oversees that. I'm looking at this possibly as we move forward with this, it becoming what DPW is. <coughs> and what DPW is, you've got a commission of DPW and you've got all these other uh, slashes that come under it, one of which is the health department, uh, elder affairs or the uh, elder services, veteran services, human services, and weights and measures. And under that, you've got the advisory boards that actually advise those departments as they exist today. So the idea is to create, you know, we have to, of course, find the funding to fund the position up here in terms of the overseer of these departments. But with all due respect to the way we've been doing things uh, as at least in the four months that I've been in that office, it's a little chaotic. Uh, we, we lose the executive director of the, uh, of the Board of Health, and, and yet the mayor who sits in that office has absolutely no say in who that person is one way or the other. Uh, to me, that's not how a city should function. I mean, the, the, the fact is, if something happened within that department, the first person that will be called to the carpet is the mayor. But yet, that mayor has no say in who sits at that, at that, at that spot. I think what we're trying to do is just modernize in this, this department, modernize these services to do what some of these other communities are doing. Uh, if we want to do what Avon does, then perhaps we ought to look in keeping uh, the city the size of Avon. But we're a city of 100,000 plus people, and I think we need to move with the times. And I, from what I've seen, the way things are functioning, and the diversity commission will also be under that human services. Uh, it just kind of dawned on me. But we're trying to get things coordinated and organized in such that the mayor is not the point uh, of all these uh, issues that we have in this in the community. That we have, you know, some um, some interdepartmental work that's being done between, let's say, elder affairs and veteran affairs. Uh, there's no coordination between the two because there's not a single point that kind of directs these individuals. So if we had somebody on top that could somehow coordinate these efforts for us, I think we'll be a better city. Now as far as what that position is gonna pay, I see it as a, a department head uh, uh, in, the, in the line of you know, what are, you know, something between what our DPW commissioner and perhaps the, um, the superintendent of buildings is getting paid. That's what I, I see the, that person earning, <laughs> you know. But we got to take the initial step in accepting the, this law in order for us to go anywhere. Because if we don't, then we're staying basically put at what we are right now. And what we are right now, frankly, it's not working for the city of Brock. We got we to gotta do what we can to move forward with this. Okay, thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Cruz. Any other councils? I'm being paid by the hour, so keep no, just... <laughs> <laughs> Council, you have a follow up? Council McGeary, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, this is going to fall on the next administration. So, Mr. Chairman, if you could put in a good word with the, uh, the, the next administration, I'd appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> I know the guy. But. <laughs> um, Dr. Brophy uh, was talking about a recent report, and I also I received that report um, from the city of Newton, uh, and it's called the Special Commission on Local and Regional Public Health, and it was just it just came out this summer, and it's something that I agree with. If you if the city is going to go through this re reorganization of this depart these departments, um, I would think you might want to follow more closely Worcester. They're the only certified uh, public health of that kind in the Commonwealth currently. Um, and um, this is on the MassGov. Everyone can get a copy of this by going to MassGov um, and looking under uh, the, board <coughs> the uh, State uh, Health Commission. Um, it's, qu it's quite long, quite in depth, but it, it, uh, it would be worth looking at. If this goes through and you get to that point, you want to create, you want to put through ordinance, create an organizational chart. I would certainly look, because you certainly could be the leader in the South Shore in, uh, in the sharing and coordinating of, of educational, the education is huge in this, um, sharing of resources, uh, especially in time of crisis, being able to reach out quickly to surrounding communities would be beneficial to all residents. So I would make that recommendation um, through you, Chair, Mr. Chair, to the uh, next administration. Duly noted. Thank, Thank you, Councillor. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> that would be you. Yeah, I know the guy. I said that. Yeah, I know who he is. Um, Attorney Bridges, I just had a few questions. Any, any other questions from the council? <clears throat> Attorney Bridges, relative to the legal ramifications, if this is accepted by this current current body, uh, the adoption is ratified. It's lawful. It's on the books in a sense. However, the next administration and more importantly, the next legislative body will have to make a decision relative to going home rule with the state house, uh, both vet- vetted on the house council and senate council side, come back uh, either favorable or unfavorable. So that's one endeavor. Or this body can bypass that and strictly do an ordinance, three readings, procedural, and adopt it that way. So there's really two different avenues that the next city council can follow. There, I, there might even be more than two, but those are certainly two. Th- those are the a two strict, we discussed tonight. Right, a strict, um, a strict adherence to the statute and the qualifications set out in the statute for the commissioner, or uh, <coughs> along with city, well, so the ordinance may or may not be necessary, I guess, in response to your question. If the next administration um, chooses to adhere to a strict reading and interpretation of the statute, then uh, the ordinances would be required in order to um, provide additional modernization to the department, but they wouldn't necessarily be required. Um, or the other route is to follow Newton and Worcester, deviate from the qualifications, and, um, and, and go the route with the ordinances and that, that modernization or progressiveness. Okay. So there are, there are multiple tracks that could be taken after this. I do want to publicly thank Mayor Rodriguez. He's in the solicitor's office, spent hours and hours on this. And mm. uh, the mayor has met with me as the president on a regular basis to discuss this and other councils as well. So uh, it's not like this is coming out of left field. And I concur with you, Mayor. I mean, we need to modernize. Um, but I also want to publicly thank Dr. Brophy. I mean, she's, it used to be Dr. Ficero, Dr. Keefe, and Dr. Brophy. So, yeah, Dr. Just Brophy, one comment sure. to make. Um, you know, we're in an interim time period here. I've been acting person in the, uh, that's running the Board of Health. And uh, we were planning on posting a position to replace that executive director. Uh, this person that's acting was never intended to be the person in, in, uh, as the continued person acting in an acting role was to hold the position or hold steady the ship until the new person can be brought in. Uh, so right now the Board of Health is left with, you know, the inability, and we've been waiting once we heard that this was happening, uh, didn't feel it was fair to post for that position because it's not fair to bring someone into a new uh, to a position when you're about to reorganize. So it's really leaving the board right now, your current board of health, um, unable to hire into a position. And if this drags on, it will be a, a difficult situation for the board. Thank you, doctor. Any questions for doc- Dr. Cruz? I mean, Dr. Cruz. <laughs> I'll <play a> doctor tonight. <coughs> Council Cruz, please. Uh, actually, a little more for probably for the attorney, uh, possibly because now I'm just thinking of something. So we compared it to the DPW department, but the DPW commissioner is the department head. Right. Any of those other people who run departments are not department heads under him, correct? The DPW is divided up into different divisions. Divisions, but not department heads. Correct. There's just one department head. In this case, and I'm just thinking out loud what I'm hearing, we're talking about hiring somebody to be at the top and to really run a huge part of the city, city government. Uh, I mean, the way we're looking at it would be so, taking over, but they would have department heads under them? Right, so I think in terms of the way it's characterized, the way that you just said, a single individual running huge parts of the city, I think that that might be inaccurate because there would be, I believe it's six or seven department heads underneath this individual. So those folks, like Mr. Rowley, would still be running their own departments, but would report to the Commissioner on Public Health and Human Services instead of reporting directly to the Mayor. So they really wouldn't be department heads? No, they, they would be department heads. They, they'd be running their own departments. They, weights and measures, elder services, um, a human services is, is uh, yeah. the health department. Those folks would all be department heads. So they would be, it would not be one person managing this massive overhaul. Well, it would be. It would be one person managing department heads. Mm. But that's also just an idea. You know, that's just an idea. And that was an idea that I've 
you know, stated very unequivocally, is borrowed from Newton and Worcester. That's what works for those folks, and those places are comparable to Brockton. That's why they were used for inspiration. But Worcester is done as a regional. Um, so I'm not necessarily familiar with, I'm familiar with the report that Councilor McGarry and Dr. Brophy are talking about, but in terms of Worcester expanding its services out to the smaller locations around it, I don't think from my reading that that was an intent of how things started. That might be the progression of where they're going, much like Cambridge, but um, I can't speak directly to that. Okay. Um, and then just to make sure I understand, you're saying if we... You're saying Newton and Worcester actually deviated from the acceptance of the state law? Yes, I have at least one of their special acts in my folder. So they did it via special act? They did. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Constant Darren Court, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> quick question, I mean, in regard to what uh, Council Cruz just stated, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's an amazing opportunity to create that position. I mean, I'm 100% in favor of it, but. Uh, my confusion, if not concern, is that um, now here we are going to create, you know, a position for somebody who will oversee at least six different departments. Uh, all of those unionized or not? As of right now, yes. So the question is, that person will not be part of the union? Um, I guess I... I couldn't say yes or no. We do have a department heads union in the city, you know, so I'm not sure if that person would be fit for the union or not. But I mean, I mean, this is something that we are creating. This is something new, completely new. Oh, they, so it would have to be accepted into the, into presumably the department heads union if the commissioner were to become unionized. Yeah, earlier on your statement, uh, you stated that um, all these departments will have to report to right. that person. Right. And that person will report to the mayor. Right. So that the question become, I mean, I mean, I can understand, you know, the comparison between the you know, the DPW Commission, which is like completely different in regard to what we are discussing right now. Right. Because as of right now, you have veteran departments, you have all those departments, which is those people are uh, solely independent. So now, what I'm seeing as a, uh, as a problem, given the fact that according to the history of the city, this department has been in existence for so long, and some of these people, I'm assuming, um, I'm hoping, will be there running those departments. So now, by virtue of creating a position like that, the question would be, what would be the relationship <coughs> of this department, given the fact that you will have to create an advisory board to advise all this department, and then that, those department will report to that person over there? Because obviously, I mean, the, the, um, the chairman mentioned that even the diversity commission will have to go under that department. Mm -hmm. So my, my issue is that in regard to the Diversity Commission, as you know, they are very independent, mm -hmm. and obviously they can take responsibility on their own. Let's say that, hypothetically speaking, they took a decision and the advisory board is not satisfied with, what would be the outcome for that? Don't you see it as problematic? So I think there <coughs> might be a little bit of confusion. So there would be... Um, Let me just go on record. I never yes. said that as chairman. <laughs> I believe the mayor. No, no, I, I, I don't think you say it like I that, but I all. think there was some guy... Okay, sorry, Mr. Chairman, but I think there was... You know, we, well, obviously, as we speak, the Diversity Commission will go, let me take it back, will go under that department. Let's say that they take a decision to go back to what I said earlier. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. So I'm assuming that let's say they take a decision. Now the advisory board can reject that. And we got to their dissatisfaction. The, the dissatisfaction. The power of the Diversity Commission or the Youth Council or Commission on Women's Issues does not change with the acceptance of this statute or the acceptance of the ordinances as they're written. Their power does not change. They are just now, I mean, for lack of a more eloquent way to put it, uh, the way our ordinances read, the diversity commission is just out here, women's issues is over here, youth commission is over here. Now, when residents or constituents or folks that are interested in Brockton want to know, okay, where does the diversity commission live? Where does youth services live? They they live under the umbrella of human services, but they don't report to human services. They're not appointed by human services. It's just a function of more efficiency that, okay, they're gonna, you know, if, if they need city guidance <clears throat> other than through the mayor, they, there is a department head that they can then go to who would be the health and human services department head, not the public health, health and human services. Two different department heads under the commissioner. Yeah, but I mean, as we speak, 
the Veterans Department right. had report to the mayor. Right. As we speak, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm just using those two departments as an example. The Diversity Commission report to the mayor. So now, by having that new position, these people will not have the power to report to the mayor. They will have to report to that person up there. They still technically would have the power to Well, report. technically, it's not a certainty. No, you understand it's very, that, right? it's not, it's specific. It's not technical, it's specific. The mayor still puts all these people on the boards, or however their board composition is via ordinance remains the same. So certainly they would have conversations and connections to the mayor. And then on top of that, the department head is still appointed by the mayor. So even though there is a layer in between, it does not derogate from the relationship or authority between the executive office and, and these departments. I mean, I understand what you are saying, though. Earlier, Mayor Rodriguez stated that when there's an issue, well, according to what just happened with the health department, right. so the mayor has to act upon that to make a decision. But the mayor has nothing to do with hiring that person. So my point to you is that if, as we speak, the mayor has no power, and of course the advisory commission, the doctor just mentioned it, myself and the board of trustee, at Mass board of Health Clinic, appoints she said the, that as exactly. of right now, they are having a hard time giving the fact that we are in the process of creating that position to hire someone because they don't know what's going to happen because they cannot just hire somebody and fire that person. She said that they have to wait. My, my question is that if, as we speak, obviously, the mayor has no power whatsoever to determine who is going to be, as we speak, that person. Now, the question is, you're going to create a position. Don't forget you said most of them are unionized. That department, you don't know whether or not it's going to be part of the union. Now, the problem is that, yes, I am 100% in favor of that. The problem is that, don't you think, well, obviously, I'm assuming, depending on which way you go, whether you're created by an ordinance or a homeowner petitions, I'm assuming that we need to discuss this in depth in regard to who that person is going to be and the power they're going to have and give these people below a certain of certainty to understand that nothing will change because you don't know that person can come and I'm not, I'm not saying do whatever he or she wants but determine this is how I want those departments to run and that can be problematic. This is something new that we don't know what will happen in, you know, once we created it. So it's not just looking at it you know, right in front of us but understand the consequences of it because these department, which the mayor stated that, they're not going to get rid of them. They're going to be there regardless. Right. We are creating a new position which will overseeing all these departments and all of them are unionized. Now, the question is, how are you going to approach that to the union? Whether or not you know, they will accept it or not? Because all of this, we don't know. I guess I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Okay, let me just repeat what I said. This is a new position that we're about to create. Right? Because we feel like we have to jump into the 21st century, which is important. As we speak, we have a lot of organization that has been operating without that department. And most of them are unionized. Don't you see any issue with whomever in charge reporting to the mayor and not having any kind of relationship with those people who've been there for so long and wanting, wanting those departments according to what they know, not what that person will tell them? I think my response is still the same, that there, there would be an opportunity for those folks who are already employed and are already running departments to have access <clears throat> to the mayor, whether it be the incoming mayor or Mayor Rodriguez. I mean, I'm sure there certainly will be lots of details to iron out. But in terms of there being like a hard line of no availability to the executive office, I don't think that that was the intent. So the, that, the, the advisory board, which we have as we speak for the health department, will only be there for the health department as we have it without overseeing the veterans department, right. uh, the diversity right. commissions. So right. this department will not have to do with the diversity commission. Correct. There is a department <clears throat> of health and then there is an advisory council to health and those two work directly together, but the Advisory Council on Health doesn't work with, I mean, they could collaborate, but does not direct or work with <coughs> diversity, women's issues, youth council, all completely separate. So, the Advisory Commission will only have the power to hire that health person, not the person of there. That person of there will be appointed only by the mayor without them. Is that correct? No. So the advisory commission will have the power to hire that new person no. plus so, the health. <coughs> now the board of health is the appointing authority for the executive 
health officer for the city. That's how it exists right now. No, no, no. I'm talking about that new position. I know, and I'm trying to help you understand. Okay. The advisory council for under, if, if you accept the statute, yeah. there's an advisory council. That person, those, that body of nine, two of whom are doctors, required to be doctors, mm -hmm. do not appoint the department head any longer. Okay. So it's, it's an advisory body. It moves from a policy and regulatory body to an advisory body. Just like diversity, just like women's issues, just like youth council. So the mayor will have the absolute power of appointing that person and having the council approve it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions, Council? Any follow-up questions? Just, Council Fowell, please. Just a, a comment, uh, and I, I'm going to move favorable in a minute, but I think having an expanded advisory council is very beneficial yes. because you can cover a whole host of health issues. But I think leaving the status quo would be I just think it would be abdicating our responsibility. And, and I would say respectfully to Dr. Brophy, given a new mayor coming in, I, I wouldn't post a position and hire someone. I mean, I, I, I think if the mayor is going to be held accountable for what happens in this city, then that person, he or she, should have the authority to put in place with the council's acquiescence the people that he or she thinks uh, will do the job and, and best represent the interests of the residents. So, I mean, I, I would hope you wouldn't post it and hire someone with a new mayor coming in in a, in a matter no, of No, we wouldn't plan on posting it, but if it does, uh, again, understanding that if this for some reason does have to go for a homeroom petition, it holds things up, and uh, depending on what you do. And the position of the executive officer has always been the, the board is appointed and the board has the authority to hire the executive officer in the in the uh, board of health i mean part of that is because the cr uh, criteria to be on that um, board uh, to pick that person requires uh, an understanding of health and uh, you know it, it was a protective mechanism against cronyism of putting people into place who may not necessarily be able to accomplish that job by having the board itself uh, um, a apply uh, or have that person appointed, that you know that they have the credentials to do the job because this one, again, there is regulatory uh, requirements for the people who are running the Board of Health to the Department of Health and to the Department, uh, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and those uh, authority, you know, these people have to be capable and have the cr uh, credentials and uh, background to be able to do the work. Otherwise, you're not serving the city well. Thank you, Doctor. I move favorable on this. Second. This motion on the floor was properly seconded. On the motion? On the motion. I just want to let, uh, as Councilor Fowler is wont to do, I just want to let the public know, I'm going to actually be voting no on this tonight. It doesn't mean I'm against this in general. I just, I still think that I, in my mind, have a lot of unanswered questions. A lot of it has having to do with cost. And uh, so I will be writing notes, voting no tonight. It doesn't mean I'm permanently against this. I, I just think there's a lot of questions that are unanswered. Thank you. Thank you, Council. This motion on the floor is properly second favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, kindly raise your hand. If you oppose, raise your hand. It's favorable back to the full city council. We'll go on to the next agenda item, please. Thank you very much, everybody. <coughs> Order. The City accepts the fourth paragraph of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5B, which allows the dedication without further appropriation of <coughs> all, or a percentage not less than 25% of particular fees, charges, or receipts to a stabilization fund <coughs> established under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5B, to be effective for the fiscal year beginning on July 1st. 2019, or take any other action relative thereto. Invited, Philip Nisralla, City Solicitor, Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Clarkson, good evening. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the Council. We provided to you a, uh, a packet of information, uh, and I would just refer you to that for uh, the discussion of agenda items 8, 9, and 10. Uh, these items in the aggregate uh, are a vehicle uh, for the city to uh, create a stabilization fund to act as the vessel 
for um, all of the receipts for both the medical and the upcoming recreational marijuana facilities. Um, so what we've provided to you is uh, a local finance opinion from the Department of Revenue Division of Local Services that provides broad guidance uh, on marijuana-related money. We've provided to you a copy of Massachusetts General <coughs> Laws, Chapter 40, Section 5B, which is actually the statute that deals with creating stabilization funds, mm -hmm. uh, and also an IGR, or informational guideline release, that deals generally with the creation of stabilization funds. And so these items, uh, as taken together, provide uh, the creation for that vessel uh, to hold the funds. I would draw your attention uh, to one necessary correction. Uh, in our review of the statute, uh, the mechanics are that should you proceed now with creating this stabilization fund, it will be effective for the receipts that we receive next year. Uh, so that the monies that we receive in this fiscal year will uh, by necessity go deposited, will be deposited in the general fund and uh, will we'll turn into uh, to free cash. So uh, this is an action that we need to take uh, so that looking forward we'll have a way uh, that the money that we receive from licensed marijuana facilities can be expended uh, under this construct, the mayor will recommend spending to the city council, and as you know, uh, spending from a stabilization <coughs> fund requires a two-thirds vote of the legislative body. Mm -hmm. So we're just really trying to, to take the next step uh, in this cannabis journey and, uh, and provide the city with a way to, uh, to segregate the funds and use them as you and the mayor collectively see fit. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Any questions for Mr. Clarkson? Council Cruz, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. So if we don't do anything, they just go into the general fund? It, correct. If you don't do anything, all the marijuana receipts will be deposited in the general fund and become free cash. And under the statute, uh, if we put, put this in, are there certain, did the cannabis law recommend any particular uh, places for these to be used? Are we required to? Use them on anything special? No, no. I, I know that the, the <coughs> mayor has some fairly broad but specific uh, ideas where he would like to use the money in public education, public safety, uh, but I think those. Uh, it wouldn't affect this fiscal year, anyways, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Council. Any other questions? Yes. Council Fowler. Mr. Follow, Chairman, please. I'm. Yeah. Well, it has to be done in Council. We'll, we'll have to amend. Uh, this item so that it says beginning fiscal year July 1st, 2020. 2020. We can't do it for this fiscal year, so that would have to read July 1st, 2020. You can offer that amendment tonight. Right. Well, then I'm going to offer that amendment. It'll have to be ratified in council. So on the, on the next to the last line of enclosure number eight, strike the date of July 1st, 2019 and put in July 1st, 2020. Council, this is Scribner's error. There's a motion on the floor just to change 20, 2019 to 2020. All that's properly second. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Any other questions relative to this agenda item? Entertain a motion then. Well, I, I, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you're the incoming mayor, and and uh, you you have not had a chance yet, I'm sure, to get a handle on finances. So, I think we have to give some deference to you. Are you comfortable with doing this uh, in advance of not getting involved with the budget and knowing where f uh, finances are going to be, or uh, do you want all, to all I can say is my role doesn't start until January 6th. The current mayor is comfortable with this. Okay. That's all I can say at this time. Then I move favorable. Second. So motion on the floor is properly second and favorable as amended with the date change. Back to the full council. All in favor? Question. I'm sorry. Questions uh, on the on the motion. Yeah. As we vote for this now, are we voting on a percentage? Pardon? Are we voting on that 25 percent? No. The specific. It it has to be not less than. But not, but are we voting on a specific percentage? The way that's written. We are not. The way it's written. The way it's written. We're not. I believe. We're not. So we really need to make this. The motion should include a percentage, I believe. 
Am I incorrect or? It's the will of the council. I mean, as stated, it's, it's uh, <laughs> not less than. It so could be more no, than 20. There's no, there's no uh, hard but, uh, number. So my question on the motion is, okay. if we were to pass it as worded, is it left up to the CFO? Is it left up to the sitting mayor? Is it left up to us? How much of that goes into that stabilization fund? It would be up to the current mayor in conjunction with the CFO. So he could do 100%? He could Is do the current mayor still here? No. No. Good question, Council. So my belief I, is, uh, I, before we vote on this, I, I'd like us to establish a percentage. Mayor, good evening. <laughs> Council Cruz just had a question relative to agenda item uh, eight. And, and, well, and I'm not sure if the mayor is the right to answer this or if uh, Solicitor Nezrella is. My question is, the way this is written, this motion, we're not specifically <laughs> designating a percentage, we're only specific, saying that anywhere from 100% of those fee, fees down to 25%. Correct. Minimum of 25%. So I just believe our motion should include a percentage. Does any harm, you can still do A specific it. percentage, is my opinion. Would you agree that that would be, I mean, it leaves, I don't like anything, I, I just personally don't think a vote out of this body that leaves vagaries such as that, that's, that leaves a 75% window. window for uh, uh, any mayor or okay. to, so I, I would ask that, uh, and I don't have a particular number in mind, but I would ask that that motion be withdrawn and that we, we make this a specific percentage. If, if, if I may, Mr. President. Mr. Claxton. I, I would, uh, draw your attention to the subsequent orders, uh, agenda items number nine and 10. Right. And if you see in those, uh, I would suggest uh, the language as prepared by the solicitor's office in those articles gives you that flexibility that should you be supportive uh, of creating the stabilization fund, the language in item number eight is from the statute. So the statute actually requires not less than 25%. Right. And then in 9 and 10, we deal with uh, the, the, specifics. Uh, the specifics because there's, uh, you see, uh, on number 9, it's the local option excise on retail marijuana. And in number 10, it's the community impact fees. And so the, the suggested process as laid out by the solicitor's office is to create the fund and then in numbers 9 and 10, you have the flexibility before you. It, it has to be not less than 25, but you can yeah. set those numbers uh, or not. And as so the what we're doing in this one is through you, Mr. Chair, is creating the stabilization fund, correct? Then I re take my request back. I don't concur with that. I don't concur with that. You don't? I think each one is specific. Tony Nazarella, do you have any opinion on this? Uh, I think it's correct that what we're doing now is creating the stabilization fund. At a later time, the council makes a determination on what the percentage will be over and above 25 percent. But it would not be this body, no. this current body. Correct. Any questions, council? My, my question would be, why, why would we ratify this now as opposed to when a new council comes in? Because the drop dead date is still July 1, 2020. I think it's more appropriate to do it when the new body comes in. When the new body comes in? Mm -hmm. Mayor? Table. There's a motion on the floor. Yep. There's a motion I, I, on the floor. You're going to withdraw, I withdraw that motion? the motion. It's a motion on the floor. It was withdrawn. The matter comes before us, councilors. To make a motion to the table. Second. Second. It's a motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. There's no discussion under Robert's rules when it's tabled. All in favor of table number nine, please raise your hand. Number eight. All eight. opposed. Number eight. I'm sorry, eight. Number eight. All opposed. It's tabled. Number nine, please. 
Order. Chairman. To see if the city will dedicate all or a percentage, which may not be less than 25 percent, of the local option excise on retail marijuana sales revenues collected. collected under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 64N, <clears throat> Section 3, to the Community Impact Stabilization Fund established under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5B, effective for fiscal year 2020, beginning on July 1st. 2019, or take any other action relative thereto. Invited Philip Nisralla, City Solicitor, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Council Alley. I'd like to make a motion to take uh, numbers 9 and 10 collectively. Second. Motion on the floor is properly seconded. Take 10 and 9 collectively. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, kindly read number 10, please. Order. To see if the city will dedicate all or a percentage, which may not be less than 25 percent, of the community impact fees collected under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 64N, and related host agreement, community agreements to the Community Impact <coughs> Stabilization Fund, established under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5B, effective for fiscal year 2020, beginning on July 1, 2019, or take any other action relative thereto. Invited, Philip Nisralla, City Solicitor, Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer. Will the Council move to table? Second. Motion on the floor to table uh, nine and ten. A it's motion? Been seconded. No, 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 no. It's been seconded. Under Robert's rules, you can't talk okay. once it's been seconded on the table. So now we have to take a vote under Robert's rules. As a matter on the floor, it was properly seconded to the table. All in favor of tabling nine and ten? Mm -hmm. All opposed? Hereby passes. It's tabled. Nine and ten are tabled. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Claxton. Thank you, Attorney Nazarello. Go on to number 11, please. Ordered. A copy of all legal documents executed between the city and the Brockton 21st Century Corporation <laughs> related to the transfer um. of control for these properties to the city and the outstanding promissory note signed by the corporation be provided to the city council. One, a summary of all outstanding contractual agreements, outstanding invoices for services or goods, or any other liability which was the responsibility of the Brockton 21st Century Corporation and which now may be incurred by the city be provided to the City Council. Two, if payments from public funds have been made for charges formally required of the corporation, such information shall be provided to the City Council. Three, documents and information requested shall be provided within 14 days of the date of this order. Invited, Michael Gallarani, Executive Director, Brockton 21st Century Corporation, Dan Evans, President, Brockton 21st Century Corporation, Philip Nisralla, City Solicitor, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Mary Lynn Peters Chu, City Auditor, Brent Warren, Attorney B21. Mr. Evans, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. And I know Attorney Warren is here as well, and um, I know this has been a long, uh, long uh, endeavor. Um, do you have any? Do you want the attorney to speak? Do you want to? How do you want to? I would just want to do whatever I can to answer any of the questions or supply any of the, or get any, give any of the information that we're uh, that I can offer. What I did was uh, the 18 and 19 uh, audits were completed. That was a big bone of contention, and uh, I gave the originals that were mailed to me to, uh, to Troy, and then I took it upon myself to make uh, copies of 18 and 19. I, I only made 10, I, I'm sorry, if I, if I, but I, I, he had to leave with everyone so they can all have that. <coughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Evans. If, uh, also, there was... A lot of what happened was prior to my regime, and uh, uh, Michael Gallarani, who was there, is no longer with us. Um, so is he, is he officially done? Done. Ceased employment 100 percent? Ceased 100 <laughs> percent. Um, so what I did was I, I, I this weekend went in and got all the bills that we paid the last six months of operation, and uh, I put them in a, a file or a table of contents. And I do have all the originals if you wanted to see them, but I am prepared. I made copies, 11 copies, that I could hand out. Sure. Just to. And thank you for doing that. I, I, you know, I. New counselors, just for information purposes, Mr. Evans is a <laughs> businessman here in the city of Brockton. He volunteers his time, unpaid, to be president of the B21 Corporation. There you go. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Councils, I just 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 to keep it on track. Um, if there's a council that wants to ask Ms. Evans or Attorney Warren or anybody a question, we're gonna we're gonna stay much like we do on the budget. We'll go by uh, those that want to speak first. Council Fowler, did you say you wanted to speak first? Any yeah. other councils, just so we can duly note it? Any expected questions for any other councils? Okay, go to Council Fowler, please. I'd like to start with uh, <clears throat> Mr. Clarkson, if I could, uh, and just ask him if. If he's had a chance to look over the information, and did you find anything, any anomalies, anything that jumped out at you? Uh, In the audit, yeah. Councillor? No. Nothing? Okay. All right. I guess my next question would be, of the bills that were paid for services rendered, for example, several different $3,000 payments for maintenance and cleaning, maintenance of cleaning, uh, I guess this question is to Mr. Evans or Attorney Warren. Uh, who verified that the services were actually performed? Who, who, who was there to witness that the work was being done? Or I, I guess what I'm asking is, have you matched up all of your disbursements to various vendors with bills in the file and verified that either the goods were actually purchased Thank the you. services were rendered. What, what quality control did we have over that? Because you were using public funds for at least 2017 and 18. Thank you. Yeah, it, as far as how that process went, it, it was under the purview of Mr. Gallerani to hire people, to pay them for their services. We didn't have direct control. Uh, Mr. Evans wouldn't have any idea other than being told what's gone on with the, with the process, uh, nor would I have any direct knowledge as to who's been hired, not hired, what work they've done other than what was presented to the board uh, in the meetings. With that being said, we were relying on the fact that our auditor was looking into this uh -huh. and making sure, and especially knowing that the, the scrutiny we were facing uh, before city council, that there was nothing that looked like it was out of the ordinary for work performed. Uh, and I can only speak, as I did before, that there were issues with the facilities as uh, we've heard in subsequent meetings, uh, repairs that needed to be done. There was, there was a lot of work that was going in and it was something that uh, Mr. Gallerani was coming back to the board routinely uh, and, and informing everybody as to all the problems that we had. But there was no direct oversight by anybody else on the board uh, double checking. I don't know how you could do that. Well, <clears throat> if I may just... Oh, go ahead. So, uh, in fairness to Troy, he has not seen the list that you've... I finished that today, so... Uh, no, no, but he's, he's, he's seen the audit. Oh, audits, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the reason I ask is it's, it's, it's interesting to me that uh, on 10-12-2018, we give someone a check for $3,400 for cleaning and S. I don't know what S is, security. Uh, then in 10-12, according to this, we, we give that same person a check for another $3,000. Um, I have 17, thank you. You know, at this point, I, I guess my question, I'm gonna ask the, the solicitor a question here. My feeling is table this and then maybe you and I can get together because I still do not believe that all of the thank public money out. was spent properly. And it's gonna take some time to look into that. I just don't get the sense that we had quality control over it, that we actually knew what was being paid for and we verified that. And I think it was left up to one person and that's not necessarily the type of internal controls you want. Uh, Council, I think that's a prudent suggestion. You and I had discussed off record before that there were a lot of minutia as well as substantive issues that have to be looked at. Uh, Trini Warren's been very helpful uh, in assisting and providing information. It have raised a lot of question with me and, and ushered into the law department, and I'd like to share that with you and perhaps uh, tabling this and having a, a closer look at it may be more fruitful in order to conjure up the questions we need to have answered. Okay, well, it, it will die at the end of this session, but certainly the topic and the information won't, so I'm going to move to table. Uh, stop. For a second, well, as president of the council, what, what I'm going to do, if, if the thought process is to begin <coughs> discussions uh, offline, I'd like to appoint as president a couple members of the council to work with the solicitor yep. and then opine back 
And then with the next legislative coming in, whoever the president is, I would ask he or she to do the same. I think that's the only way <coughs> to do it in, in a proper manner. Uh, to just have one point person working, the solicitor, and there's 11, I think something could look, get lost. Right. So it would almost be like a, an unofficial subcommittee working on a specific agenda matter. Any objections on that? No. Seeing none, that, that's what we'll do. And then, again, whoever takes over the reins uh, in January can, can do that as well. Okay? Councilor Cruz. I now just uh, ask the request that it not be tabled, that will be postponed, so that if before the end of the year, any of these questions could be answered. Once, once we table it, it probably won't come I back concur with that as well, yes. I, I, I'd request that a proposal be, and we can postpone it. We, indefinitely, really. Meeting, indefinitely yeah. if we need to, but uh, just in case we can get those answers before the end of the year, there's no sense for it to die, and tabling is sometimes difficult to to get it off the table with the amount of votes. I agree. Needed. It was a motion, but it wasn't seconded. Second. So there was not a second on that motion on the table. No, man. no the table. No. Draw you, you don't even need to withdraw it. Okay. Um, so, so again, under the procedure, we would have to do a date certain to postpone it. So I, I would make a would... motion to postpone until the next finance meeting. Second. And we Second. can let the people know if we're not ready to, that they don't need to attend that night. But otherwise, uh, let's postpone it till the uh, first finance meeting in December. In December. Okay. That'd everybody, be everybody in agreement on that? Council Fowler, are you okay with that? Uh, it's, it's up to the solicitor's schedule. I, I... You know what the date would be, Councilor? <clears throat> well, we would meet with the solicitor, whoever's going to be on that subcommittee, probably during the day, but that would probably be December 2nd. 3rd? 2nd? 2nd. Monday's the 2nd. Monday's second. Monday's the second. Okay. Uh, okay? Well, it could be fluid, but... I won't be... Uh, Monday will be difficult for me, Monday the 2nd. Uh, I can do it any time thereafter. We'll do it December 16th? It's the will of the council. Does that sound that plenty of time, councilors? Make a motion to postpone until December 16th. Okay. Second. That's the second FinCom in December. On the motion? On the motion. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Evans and Attorney Warren. This is already more cooperation than we've had sometimes. Yeah. Although I will say that I think sometimes we as a council forget in our frustration over where the stadium and the ballpark have been that the board has always been a volunteer board <coughs> that has given many hours and lots of time and has very often been vilified in this community for what they've done for the, for the 21st Century Corp board. It has been a wonderful board all these years. And I just want to say and I thank you. I mean, for you to do this yourself, thank you very much because I know you don't have an executive director anymore and right now it's basically almost a shadow corporation while we figure out where we're going and I just want to thank you. And I, I echo the sentiments. And Mr. Mr. Evans has come to many, many meetings, stayed here many, many hours. He's always a gentleman and always gives us the information we're looking for. So thank you, Mr. Evans, and thank you, Attorney Warren, although you might have billable hours, so you have to be here anyhow, all right? <laughs> um, but with that being said, this motion on the floor is properly second to postpone until December 16th, second FinCom in the month of December. All in favor? All opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good evening. So that's what we're going to do on that one, guys. Uh, next agenda item, please. Ordered. A resolution to file and accept grants with and from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs for the Parkland Acquisitions and Renovations to John L. O'Donnell Playground, invited Timothy Carper, Carpenter, <laughs> Superintendent of Parks. Mr. Carpenter, good evening. Good evening, Councillors. Uh, so this is the park grant. Uh, it's the same grant that the city has utilized to do some work at Edgar's, uh, Keith Park, and most recently at Walker's. Uh, this time we have applied for the O'Donnell Playground. Um, the state has agreed to fund the project and uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the next step in the process, um, the accepting of the funds. It is a two year uh, grant opportunity. <coughs> the first year is design, second year is construction. Any questions? I'd thank be happy Mr. to Carpenter. try and answer Any them. questions for Mr. Carpenter? Council Beauregard, please. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you for coming up in front of us. So uh, I guess at this point, will you be holding any kind of uh, community meeting to let people have some input so on we, this? We do have a, a preliminary plan, uh, and we would like to try and have a community meeting to present that preliminary plan, yes. <coughs> okay, probably after the holidays. Correct. Okay, okay. no, thank you. That, that that's I want people to be notified about that because naturally they won't have an input. And I want to thank you for going after all these grants as you do. And uh, people will be grateful because um, it's I remember that playground um, over 50 years ago. So it needs an upgrade. And and thank you and thank you for letting the 
community participate in its you know future. So thank you, and I'd like to thank move you, that Council. favorably. Thank you. Second. Motion on the floor, properly second favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand, please. If you're opposed, that carries. Thanks, Mr. Capita. Thank you. Favorable back to the full council. Madam Clerk. Ordered appropriation of $2,258,845 from unappropriated estimated receipts for fiscal year 20 of the general fund, increase in Chapter 78, to net school spending and further appropriate $1,178,496. <clears throat> from net school spending to non-net school spending. Invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Aldo Petronio, Chief Financial Officer, Brockton Public Schools, Michael Thomas, Acting Superintendent of Brockton Public Schools. Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President and members of the Council. We also provided in that supplemental packet uh, under a heading that is for items 13 and 14 some additional information uh, on the next two items with uh, the permission of the the chair i'll just walk you through uh what's before you yes i uh i did provide uh, to the council and others uh including my colleague at the school department uh an overall view of what our funding plan is to address the deficit in the non-net school spending. So I'll walk you through that briefly. And then, of course, uh, be happy to answer any questions. I've been in regular contact with Aldo Petronio, the CFO at the schools, uh, throughout the last several months to address this. So uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, <coughs> he's happy to answer any questions at all. Uh, as you know, and has now been well publicized, there is a funding gap in the non-net school spending, which is essentially school transportation, for $6,178,493. We have, working together, developed uh, a strategy to fully fund that gap uh, through the following means, uh, and a, and a transfer within the operating budget for $4.5 million. Uh, an appropriation from available funds, that is because you have not yet set the tax rate uh, and our revenues exceed the, the spending for this fiscal year, there are funds available to appropriate. And so one of uh, the several suggested funding items before you tonight uh, is $500,000 to go toward that non-net school spending. And then uh, this specific item, a transfer, uh, of $1,178,493 from the additional Chapter 78 uh, to address the balance of that. I would, uh, I think for clarity's sake, I think the language that's been prepared in, in this order uh, certainly is, uh, is very clear, uh, but it, for purposes of further clarity, uh, you may want to, I would suggest an amendment that uh, where it says further appropriate 178496, the word transfer uh, may provide more clarity than further appropriate. So this particular item uh, in that packet, you'll see uh, a letter f uh, dated September 12th from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And in that <coughs> letter, uh, the Commonwealth describes uh, an additional aid amount uh, I'm, I'm sorry I refer you back to the September 11th letter from the Brockton Public Schools uh, the supplemental appropriation uh, the additional chapter 78 is two million two hundred and fifty eight eight forty five which is in your order uh, and so what we're asking uh, is that from that additional state aid, uh, you're taking a portion of that and appropriating it to the non-net school spending to address a portion of this funding deficit. Uh, in order for purposes of clarity, uh, and item 14, the next one, that's where you have a request to transfer money uh, mm -hmm. within the operating budget for four and a half million dollars. I know there's been significant questions and some confusion on that. Uh, so just to further clarify, uh, beyond the email that I sent you Thursday evening, 
Uh, there is no proposal on the table to transfer any money from the health insurance trust fund. Uh, we are instituting, uh, with the, the support of the mayor uh, and uh, with the advice of our health insurance consultant, a premium holiday, which means that our employees, all those employees whose health insurance is paid from the trust fund, will, uh, will not pay their health insurance premiums for the month of December. The impact on that uh, will be that our budgeted amount uh, in the Human Resources Department, the budget line that I described to you, uh, that includes nearly $54 million in funding, uh, we will not be required to spend money <coughs> from that account and place it into the trust fund in December, thereby freeing up that money for transfer within the budget. As you know, budgetary transfers within lines is something that not only are you empowered to do as the legislative body, but it's something that this body and all legislative, local legislative bodies in the Commonwealth do quite frequently. So uh, I, I, I wanted to clear that up because I know that's been, uh, there's been several questions related to that. Thanks. So uh, those three items that are listed uh, on that first page in, in that section of your packet, I think outline in detail our strategy to meet that funding gap, uh, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilors, we're in number 13. Um, mm. The CFO mentioned that we might want to contemplate um, amending it so it does not say further appropriate and change that, those two words with the word transfer. So we may want to consider that yes. to make it uh, appropriate as such. Mr. Chairman. Councilor. Thank you. Uh, actually, I'm not sure that. Uh, Aren't we actually looking at two different appropriations here? Shouldn't this be split? Uh, so we're appropriating from from un, uh, from estimated receipts, but we're also transferring from net school spending to non-net school. Those are two different orders, aren't they? Shouldn't they be? The total is two million two hundred fifty-eight, but they're from two different sources. Shouldn't they be two different orders? Well, they're actually from the same source, right? The the source is the additional chapter seventy-eight provided <clears throat> by the Commonwealth. So what this is asking you to do is to appropriate a portion of that to net school spending and the remainder of it to non-net school spending. I mean, I'll certainly defer to, to council, but I believe the process is in order. It's, it's taking the additional state aid uh, and placing it in the school two, department, but in two different but into places. Two different, two different places. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's saying, I mean, it, I'll defer to the council's wishes, but it, what I, my read of this is it's saying you have this extra $2.2 million. Our suggestion is that it be appropriated to the school, net school spending, and then transfer an amount from there and the amount of 1178496 to, to non-net. Yeah. So it, I'm I, not trying to throw a monkey wrench into this because we need to get it done and all, but yeah. I, I believe that. So we're taking one appropriation, but sending it to two different places. Uh, my belief in my history, <clears throat> in my 14 years, is that should be two separate orders. I mean, I, Take I, a well, two-minute recess. Back in session, Councilor Cruz, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd make a motion that we split the question. Second. Motion on the floor, properly second, to split the question. Uh, all in favor of splitting the question. All opposed. Uh, Council, please state how you want it split. So the first question would be an appropriation of 2,258,845 from unappropriated estimated receipts for fiscal 20, year, fiscal 20 of the general fund to net school spending. <coughs> That's that's okay. the that's the first section. That's the first question. Okay. Yeah. Second question will be to appropriate from net school spending one million one hundred seventy eight thousand four ninety six to non net school spending. And I think I think on that uh, the CFO had recommended that we change the transfer. word further appropriate to transfer. Yeah. So for for dotting the i's crossing the t's is that something you'd want to do, Councillor? Uh, let me rephrase that to tr transfer from net school net school spending to non net school spending. Exactly. 
So we've split this motion. We voted on it to split it. It was just clarified by the <coughs> Ward 1 Council. Everyone's clear on what we're talking about right now? Yes. All right? Okay. Any questions for the CFO relative to this or any of the other invited guests? We have Mr. Thomas here, Superintendent. We have a lot of people here. Just, just for a piece of information, I've met with uh, Mr. Petronio, Mr. Thomas, Vice Chairman Incello, Mr. Claxon, uh, and the Mayor about this issue. So we're all, uh, we're all clear on this. Um, Motion for a, favor, recommendation. Thank you, Council. Thank you. As, as stated by Council. As Cruz, stated correct? by Council. Second. Motion on the floor, properly seconded. Uh, favorable recommendation back to full Council, as stated. All in favor? I'll oppose that motion carries. It's favorable back to the full council. Thank you. We'll go on to the next uh, agenda item, please. Mo well, motion for to recommend the second question. Second. Favorably. Fine. Motion on the floor is properly seconded for the split section, favorable back to the full council with the amendment of uh, transfer replacing further appropriate. All in favor? All oppose. That motion carries. Favorable as amended back to the full council on the split. Now we can go on to number 14, please. Ordered transfer of four million five hundred thousand from health insurance employee benefits to non-net school spending. Invited <clears throat> Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial mm -hmm. Officer, Alto Petronio, Chief Financial Officer, Brockton Public Schools, Michael Thomas, Acting Superintendent of Brockton Public Schools. Good evening, Ms. Clarkson. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. So this is uh, a transfer from human resource health insurance budget to the non-net school spending which is made possible uh, by the performance of our health insurance trust fund. Just to give a little texture in history, we went back and looked at the history of the health insurance trust fund uh, and over the last <coughs> six years uh, the balance uh, and at its lowest was just slightly less than $9 million. Uh, the trust fund for the fiscal year that ended last June 30th, uh, the performance of the trust fund was a surplus of slightly more than $3 million. So we have a health insurance consultant uh, who on a monthly basis monitors the, the money that comes in through the employees and through the city uh, that paid claims. We are a self-insured trust fund, which means that those claims are actually paid from the money uh, that's provided by the city and our employees. It's not a fee-based or premium-based health insurance. In addition to that, there are admin fees from Blue Cross and Harvard. There's free insurance premiums. We have an insurance policy here in the city. Uh, as the most self-funded health insurance groups for seven years before I came here. I was on the board of a regional group very similar to this that provides health insurance to approximately 30 municipalities and school districts in eastern and southern Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, we also book reimbursements that we get from that reinsurance policy. So very briefly, for anyone not familiar with reinsurance, we buy an insurance policy that protects us against high claims. And so you can set that limit. Uh, generally, ours right now is 350,000. Oh, thank you. Uh, and so we're protected against any high claims. If we get claims that exceed that amount, we get a reimbursement uh, from that insurance policy, and that's reflected. And so our health insurance consultant, uh, which was formerly Cook and Company, is now Gallagher provides uh, an analysis on a monthly basis that shows us exactly where we're at. Uh, in, in, in my history, I've met with the consultant on a monthly basis and we've instituted that here in Brockton. And so we, we know that for the last fiscal year, the Health Insurance Trust Fund performed very strongly uh, and is actually doing uh, very well so far this year. So because of that and that strong performance, uh, we have the ability to, uh, to have what's called a premium holiday. And again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's uh, where the, neither the city nor the employees pay their share for a month uh, because of the performance of, of the fund. Uh, st uh, last year, we had $51 million in claims. The rule of thumb, generally, from a policy perspective, is that you want uh, 15, at least 15 percent of your annualized claims in reserves. So if we look at $51 million in claims, 
rounded purpose is 7.6. Let's call it $8 million is the minimum we would want to have in our trust fund. <coughs> uh, so that, that actual balance varies because there's money coming in and money going out on a regular basis. Uh, but certainly, uh, our trust fund balance consistently is in the high teens, uh, and so it well exceeds the, the amount uh, that we would have as a target to, uh, to, to have enough money in reserve to be comfortable and to have a healthy trust fund. So as a result, uh, we can return some of that money uh, to, to the people who provided it. And so it not only goes back, this money is segregated from the rest of the city's money because it doesn't belong entirely to the city. It belongs jointly to the city and to the employees who contribute on a regular basis to the trust fund. So when we have that premium holiday next month, the employees will just, they will not pay their weekly contributions uh, or uh, however often they're paid, either weekly or, or twice a month. And the city will be relieved of its responsibility to pay into the trust fund leaving a surplus in the health insurance budget that's available for any municipal purpose. In this case, we propose that that money be made available for transfer to non-net school spending. Uh, so again, as I stated a few minutes ago, uh, I did provide uh, you and, and some other uh, of uh, our local officials uh, a DT detailed email uh, last week to try to explain uh, what I just said uh, in the same level of detail. Um, <coughs> and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, Aldo is here, as the Mr. President mentioned, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Uh, Council Yanieri, please. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clarkson, for uh, bringing us this uh, information um, to us this evening. And um, <coughs> thank you to you and the Mayor, because the one thing I like is a to know I got a little premium holiday in December, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. It, uh, it's definitely going to uh, make a lot of our employees very, very happy that are part of the uh, health insurance um, process here within the, within the city and city government in itself. Uh, similar to what happened under, um, <coughs> not the Belzotti administration some uh, five and a half, six years ago when we were able to have a holiday as well for the same type of a situation. So um, I, I totally appreciate that. And um, I, I would probably obviously say with the way that our policy, our, our health insurance trust works, it obviously <coughs> must, um, it sounds to me like um, one of the probably the, the greatest things we may have here within the city um, is I don't think that we see our employees abusing the system at all. And do you agree with me on that, Mr. Clarkson? I don't think that we have our policies being abused in any such way so that we're able to do such a thing like this and, and expenditures are, are made in the correct way. Am I right? Pretty correct. Th th this is <coughs> a, the fund is performing well and our, our employees are working hard to stay healthy. And, 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 that, and that's good to hear. I guess the second note is in regards to this um, and what we're doing here this evening, I would hope um, this also uh, gives up, um, you know, the, the thought of what could have been um, maybe a difficult time when we not having enough money to pay for school buses um, from this point forward till the end of June. But I think this is also going to clear up that particular issue as well. Am I correct, Mr. Clarkson, on that? Okay. Yes, I, that's the purpose of the transfer. That's right. And, and I also think... In, in my own mind, um, as I've made comment before, um, that I don't believe that in any way um, the former late mayor was going to do anything that was going to at all hurt the children of this city. Um, having been a school community member for four years himself, rep representing the great uh, ward of Ward 5, which I did for 20 years, and uh, nor was he going to um, at, at all um, you know, make it any type of, of difficulty that he would not be able to find the funds because I think in his mind, we won't know that, but I think in his mind he knew how he was going to correct um, this, this problem that we had before <coughs> us because he would have never, as I said, never done anything to hurt the children of this, uh, of this city. So um, with that being said, um, and also with um, the support of, of, of yourself and of course the support of Mayor Rodriguez, and I know um, I had discussion with them several times in regards to the matter with the, uh, um, even with the support of uh, the incoming mayor, um, uh, Councilor Sullivan, who's also 
um, had support with him in regards to it and what was going on, that I, I think that um, you know this issue pretty much comes to a, um, a moment of uh, fact that we're we're done and and that we're able to make sure that our children are bus to and from school the proper way from now to the end of the school year. I'm correct on that, right, Mr. Clarkson? Yes. I am. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much and all the work and, uh, and uh, diligence uh, that you did. Um, uh, just the beginning of uh, some of the difficult tasks you face as you, as you stand in front of us as our CFO, but you knew that when you took the job. Indeed. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Council Cruz, followed by Nicastro, followed by Farwell, please. Thank you. Um, I hate to throw another monkey wrench in, but I believe, and we need to get this done, I believe in the past an interdepartmental transfer needs a letter from the affected department head to back it up. Uh, we've had that in the past. Um, can you make sure that we get that uh, by next Monday night if we proceed tonight um, in the file? Because it, uh, an interdepartmental transfer, when you're taking appropriated monies out of one department and putting it into another, that department head has to acknowledge that, that they're okay with it. And it's, it's happened in the past out of the human resources. <coughs> the personnel, well, it was a personnel department at the time, which is why I just know. So I don't want to hold this up tonight, but can you make sure we get that backup letter? For sure. I was not aware of that uh, prior requirement, so we'll be happy to make that. This process has obviously been coordinated throughout with the director <laughs> of HR. So you, uh, I'm sure. Uh, that's, I just uh, I don't want the Department of Revenue coming back to us later and saying you've done this incorrectly and thrown, thrown a monkey wrench into it. So... But I know in the past an interdepartmental, is that right, or intra, interdepartmental transfer needs, inter, a, yes. needs a, a letter from the affected department head. So thank you. Counselor, I mean, counsel, thank you. Um, Mr. Clark says it's not a requirement, it's just past practice, and it gets filed with the clerk's office, and then it's transmitted to the council. Okay, thank happy you. to do that, yeah. Uh, thank you, Council Cruz. Um, Nic Council Nicastro, please, and then Fawel, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Clarkson. I just wanted to briefly say I'm so relieved. I had all the confidence in the world that you would find a solution to this challenge and not leave especially our children hanging or walking. And so I wanted to say thank you. I think this is a rather clever solution to provide the lion's share of the funds needed to cover our shortage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Council Falwell, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clarkson. Thank you for our protracted conversation today. Um, just to get out into the public, you agree that we should not short fund transportation again. Am I, am I correct? that that is not a commonly accepted nor recommended budget practice? <laughs> I would say that certainly uh, it, it's not recommended to do that. Uh, what I learned this afternoon in conversation with the school CFO is out of necessity here in the city of Brockton, it has been uh, fairly common. Well, it's, it's been common for about five or six years, but I, Councillor Ian Erie and I served on the school committee for many years, and I can tell you that when we started the fiscal year on July 1st, the budget was the budget, because it, it, it's, it's a bit disingenuous uh, to say that we have a fully funded school department and we find out, oops, we've got $6 million that needs to be covered. now. The mayor and I uh, took it on the chin, shall we say, and I'm a big boy and so is he, I don't care, that either we were liars or we were incompetent because we didn't realize that there was this problem. There was a 30-second comment by the prior superintendent. I readily admit publicly I didn't see it. If I saw it, I, I missed it here. If I was in the room or I wasn't taking notes, but I'll tell you what else is interesting to me. This is the budget book that the school department gave out for fiscal year 2020. There isn't a footnote, there isn't an asterisk, there isn't one single mention of non-net school spending possibly being underfunded and that would threaten school transportation. As a matter of fact, the tab here on non-net school spending simply says <clears throat> total ordinary maintenance for transportation 11,623089 
personal services. It came out to uh, the entire total came out to 12, 478, 498. <clears throat> and then it has here total non-net appropriation from mayor, 12 million, 478, 498. There is nothing here that says anything to the contrary. But now let's take a look at our own budget book. And when the mayor said we were surprised, I go to the written record because I can miss something in terms of, of uh, the spoken record. I, I simply do not have the capability of remembering every word that's spoken by every department head. But in here we have school department and we have non-net school spending. And it has department, under 2020 department requested zero. Doesn't even have a figure in here that was recommended by the school department or the superintendent. And by the way, just for the benefit of the school committee members here, once you vote on that budget, that's your budget. That's not the superintendent's budget. That's not Mr. Petronio's budget. That's your budget. You own it. You voted for it. That's yours. So now we have this handout that we received on the evening of budget hearings. And this one is very interesting because it mentions six years of budget cutting, FY20 deficit 5.6 million. And then it has in here the projected budget revenues versus the requested budget estimated level services 173319870 mayor's appropriation as of 52119 this is for this is for net school spending 1684860098 so the deficiency is 4833772 and then it lists 20 different areas where the school department was able to come up with reductions to address that there isn't one single asterisk parentheses footnote anything in this document that mentions that we have a problem with school transportation, non-net school spending, and that we're going to have to come up with additional funds. Now, I know I've been criticized for mentioning Mayor Carpenter. He was the chairman of the school committee. There was a conscious decision made, whether you like it or not, to underfund transportation. And had that not been done, I think you and I spoke today, the school committee would have had to go back and probably lay off people. I don't know how else you would have made up that, that difference. So that decision was made, that philosophy, that strategy, whatever you want to call it, that was made. So where am I going with all this? Well, even when the mayor tragically died on July 3rd, did anyone send a memo to Mayor Rodriguez saying, we know you're taking over, you've got a lot of issues on your plate, here are the critical issues facing the school department. As a matter of fact, every department head in the city should have done that. When they know that he's coming in and he's inherited that job, every single department head in this city should have sent him a critical issue memo. This is what you're going to have to face in the next week, two weeks, 30 days. I mean, that's just common sense. But as I understand it, you didn't remember the 30 seconds, and you found out about it September 11th. Why was there such a delay from the time of the mayor's passing if he was the one that was going to create a plan to getting the information to Mayor <coughs> Rodriguez? I can't answer that. It just seems odd to me that nothing was referenced, and I would hope in the future that if the school department is going to have a problem, tell us about it. You know, footnote it. Put a, put a separate memo together and say, look, even if you pass this, these are the issues we're going to be facing. These are the things that we hope that you will be able to assist us with in the future. And I don't think that's asking too much. Uh, again, I take full responsibility for missing the 30 seconds of comment by Superintendent Smith, but I assure you I am neither a liar nor am I incompetent yet. Future years, who knows, but I'm not there yet. And I'm happy to cooperate and put my uh, support behind what's going on here, but I hope this doesn't happen again. It, it really shouldn't happen again. I mean, if you want to play with anything, play with instructional supplies, play with technology. If you're going to short fund something, don't do school transportation, which is public safety for children. But I don't recommend short funding anything. Have a true, accurate, transparent budget 
that the council, the city, and the parents can believe in. Because I think in the long run, that's going to benefit all of us. And thank you for your time, uh, colleagues and uh, Mr. Chairman. Councilors, going forward, you're going to hear this on January 6th, but going forward, I'm going to reinstitute um, meetings, regular meetings, of all local elected officials, from the mayor to the city council to the school committee, much more sharing of ideas. I'm also going to invite, uh, respectfully, whoever the president is, uh, asked to be here on a regular basis as the incoming mayor, asked the vice chairman, and I already spoke to Superintendent Mike Thomas. It's going to be much more communication, much more collaboration, much more sharing of ideas to benefit everybody, and more importantly, the people that we serve. So rest <coughs> assured, there's going to be much more um, being on the same page, no surprises. And as a father of two kids that take the bus, I want to just thank everybody that, that got to squid away, the mayor, the superintendent, Mr. Clarkson and the Vice Chair, so thank you. But rest assured, there will be, thank you, Councillor, there will be a lot more information. <coughs> and on the flip side, there's going to be an invitation from a Councillor at Large and a Ward Councillor to come before the School Committee at least once a month as well. So there's going to be some changes that are going to be very positive for everybody. Councillor Derencourt, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Clarkson, I just want to thank you for uh, actually finding a way to, uh, you know, get this money. And I think that, given the fact that I think my colleague uh, Council Fowler uh, literally stated what I was about to say, but I strongly believe there was a, a lack of transparency in regard to that process because uh, $6 million is not $600,000. And I think uh, down the road somebody knew this was going to happen. And of course, uh, given the fact that you know the school committee voted on it, I don't want to blame them for it, but I think that you know, as the chairman of the school committee, I'm assuming that the late mayor was actually know what was going on. So with that being said, I strongly feel like, you know, our children was putting in a position where, you know, their parents would have to do something. But fortunately, you, with your ability not only to play with numbers, but also to find ways you, uh, you know, uh, safely save them. But I think that uh, I hope in the future this is something that uh, we do not repeat because obviously, you know, facing a situation like that, uh, most people, especially those who are watching, may not understand the complexity of having, you know, to find a way to come up with $6 million. And the question is, I'm assuming that if we, if they didn't do it like that, some of our teachers would have to be laid off. But I think it was a safe call. So um, I wasn't happy about it. I'm not happy about it. And I will never be about, happy about it because the fact that this is our tax payers money and of course they are paying taxes so we can receive the best quality service in the city and and and, and, and having to deal with something like that especially under the Rodriguez administration which is uh, something that was unexpected was truly you know unacceptable given the fact that you know Mayor Moses Rodriguez wasn't planning on dealing with this but I think you know your staff uh, did a wonderful job and we got to find a way to actually pulling money from different departments so we can actually funding this and I think that I hope you know, my colleagues, especially those of you uh, who are coming on board, will do your due diligence to making sure that you know when you see numbers come in front of you, so you can actually take the time to analyze it. Council Farid uh, said it earlier. You know my mistake. I didn't really see this information coming out, given the fact that the late superintendent you know made a few statements. But I think that you know all of us uh, truly you know is at fault in regard to dealing with this. But I think. The former administration has a lot to do with this. It's not a sense of frustration in regard to what happened, but I think <laughs> somebody knew something was, was going on. And of course, to, 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 to push away $6 million that could have benefited our children was something that was not only calculated, but plenty ahead of time to do what they think was best. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just thank want you. to say this publicly. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Lally, please. All right. Um, from, from what I'm gathering, this was not, you know, I, I don't think that the, the school committee or the school department or the Carpenter Rodriguez administration or this body uh, happened to, to, to miss something or to drop the ball. <coughs> I, you know, I've spoken with members of the school committee. I've spoken with people in the city. This was not something that, uh, you know, somebody said, oh, hey, wait, we forgot to, you know, secure busing for all of our kids. This, this is a, you know, something that the administration had done before and was was interrupted by the untimely passing of the mayor um, I don't think that this is something that the administration uh, is, is really is really to blame for I think this is a way that they 
happen to fund or happen to operate, you know, their, the government when they were in power. Um, I, I do just want to, to, to move this forward, and I'd like to recommend uh, this favorably to the full city. Council. Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor. Um, there's a motion on the floor, properly second. It's a favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor of that, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. It's favorable back to the full council. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Again, thank you, our colleagues from the school committee, for being here, Mr. Petronio and the superintendent as well. Thank you. Go on to the next agenda item, please. Ordered appropriation of $790,000 from unappropriated estimated receipts for fiscal year 20 of the general fund to various departments. Invited Honorable Mayor Moses Rodriguez, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Stephen Williamson, Acting Chief of Police, Dave Farrell, Director of Veteran Services, Tom DeShellis, Supervisor, Animal Control. Mr. Clarkson, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the Council. It's my honor and privilege to have the mayor here with me on this item. Uh, so this is the final of the three prongs of the funding strategy for the non-net school spending, uh, but also included in this, uh, working closely with the mayor, are some additional uh, funding requests. So I would refer you in that supplemental packet we gave you to the document that's titled FY20 City of Brockton Appropriation Order Budget Reductions by City Council. That document details the actions this body took when you considered uh, the proposed FY20 budget back in June. And as you recall, there were several uh, reductions that you made in that budget, both from the general and from the enterprise fund. Mm -hmm. And so the general fund reductions were $1,457,166. So there were revenues to support those appropriations, and those revenues still exist. Because the tax rate has not yet been set, those are what we call available <coughs> funds. There are actually, based on other numbers uh, that we can talk about in more detail another time, additional new growth and the additional state aid that, uh, that, that the legislature provided, there are available funds uh, that are available to you uh, to appropriate before the tax rate is set, which, by the way, uh, working with um, going to steal my President thunder, Mr. Clarkson. You're going to steal my thunder. I was going to tell you at the end. <laughs> All right. Council's I'll leave that as a surprise for the for the mayor elect to share with the you. The classification here is going to be Monday, December 2nd, 6:30 p.m. I was going to say that at the end, but thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, out of that money that's available for further appropriation, uh, working with the mayor, we are proposing an additional $790,000 uh, in spending. Uh, including in that as f the final $500,000 to, to close that non-net gap. And in addition, uh, there is a request for uh, funding some additional uh, cruisers for the traffic division of the police department, uh, a feasibility and design study for the Little Red Schoolhouse, which I know has been <laughs> a policy priority for some on the council. Uh, working with the mayor, uh, he's looking to uh, reshuffle the deck, so to speak, of some of the, the offices in City Hall. There's some requested funding uh, for some of that work. Uh, and also, the, I know the Animal Control Department has for some time uh, sought an upgrade in, in their facility. I've had the opportunity to tour it. And before you uh, is a request for some money to take a look at what can be done to that facility. So uh, I'm here to answer any questions on that. I know the respect. <coughs> Motion department. to recommend favorably. Okay. Well, there you go. Some, <laughs> some motion on the floor, probably second. It's favorable back to the full city council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Claxton. Thank you. I also want to thank the acting chief for being here, Mr. Gicellis for being here, Mr. Yeah. Farrell for being here, and of course the mayor. We'll go on to number 16, please. Ordered that the city council rescind the following appropriation of $150,000 that was in City Council and approved on July 22nd, 2019 from available funds, free cash, to School Department, $150,000, invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Aldo Petronio, Chief Financial Officer, Brockton Public Schools, Michael Thomas, Acting <coughs> Superintendent of Brockton Public Schools. Ms. Clarkson. Mr. President, members of the Council, this is simply a housekeeping issue. I think uh, putting that, that article together uh, and, and looking at closing the books for FY19. The nomenclature in there uh, should have just, as, as we discussed in those previous articles, have been just available funds and, and not free cash, because as you know, free cash won't be certified uh, until 
sometime later this calendar year. So we're asking you to rescind that vote so that that doesn't hit against our free cash, and, and we will resubmit that with the proper nomenclature. <coughs> Mr. President? <coughs> yes. Uh, if you recall, I was one that asked this, this to be sent to finance yes. last week, and I've seen that uh, this is how the Department of Revenue recommended it be done, so make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Favorable back to the full council. There's a motion on the floor. All in favor, raise your hand, please. All opposed. It's favorable back to the full council. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. We'll go on to number 17, please. Resolve to invite a representative from the Justice Center of Southeast Massachusetts to present to the City Council proposals currently being reviewed in the State Legislative Session in the Joint Judiciary Committee, the Homes Act, and CEC Bill. Invited Laura F. Kamara, Attorney, Justice Center of Southeast Massachusetts, LLC, Brian O'Connor, Esquire, Program Manager, Justice Center of Southeast Massachusetts, LLC. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here and thank you for your patience. It was a long night, so thank you. Do you have a statement for the committee? Yes. Uh, thank you for having me, and special thanks to Councillor Beauregard for, uh, for her oh, support in this matter. Um, I'll be brief. There are two bills currently before the State House, um, both of which support uh, housing stability in the Commonwealth. We are asking that the city um, pass a resolution in support, showing support for those two bills. Uh, the first of the two bills is the right to counsel in eviction cases. Using numbers from the trial court as well as from U.S. Census data, one in 15 families renting in Brockton will be evicted this year. Of those, <clears throat> less than 4% will be represented by an attorney. Statewide, uh, about 92% of tenants are unrepresented in eviction cases compared to 66% of landlords. This has severe ramifications on housing stability, and that is why we are asking this council to support, show its support for those bills. There are a number of landlords uh, in the Brockton area who are supportive of this measure, uh, specifically Beacon Communities, Beacon Residential Management, and Trinity Management, all of which are landlords for hundreds of units in the city of Brockton. Uh, additionally, the cities of Bro uh, Boston, Cambridge, Northampton, and Springfield all have passed ordinances supportive of this legislation. The second of the two bills is an eviction sealing measure. Uh, currently, <coughs> eviction records are a public record in the Commonwealth and are available online, uh, reviewable by landlords, but in oftentimes uh, more severely reviewable by uh, tenant reporting companies, re companies that gather data for landlords to utilize to determine or screen their tenants. Um, this has resulted in long-term harm to tenants, um, both adults and unfortunately minor children who are frequently named in eviction cases, uh, though technically legal, inaccurately. Um, and so the eviction ceiling bills that are before the State House would not seal all eviction cases. They would simply seal those cases where the tenant either won uh, by a judgment of the court or um, entered into an agreement and complied with that agreement. Uh, it would further seal all cases <laughs> after a period of three years, allowing tenants to move on with their lives. Uh, those cases that uh, are within the three-year period could also be sealed for good cause shown to a judge. Uh, in support of this measure, I do have um, for the council uh, a study conducted by Massachusetts Law Reform Institute called Evicted for Life, uh, if anyone would like to review it, uh, that details the harm that having eviction records can cause uh, for tenants again, including children who shouldn't even be named in these cases in the first place. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions, but I would just highlight again that one in 15 tenants in Brockton will face an eviction. So this is a rampant problem in our city and something that's truly affecting housing stability and frankly, the stability of the city as a whole. Thank you, Thank attorney. You. Counsel, please. Thank you. I, I filed the resolve and I was asked to. I do want to point out that um, the Senate bill has been support, endorsed by our state senator and one of our counts, um, I'm sorry, st state reps has also 
gotten on board with uh, the House bill. And uh, Council, which rep is that, please? Uh, uh, Dubois. Okay, thank you. And uh, the others are reviewing. And um, this front page on Sunday's paper, rent spiked. Now they face eviction from apartments, and this was pretty, oh, you know, devastating to hear. And what was really sad was the condition of the building in the first place. So I was asked to promote this, and because several other communities have gotten on board with these challenges, and we have information available, and I, I see that you passed it out to emphasize uh, what a grandmother went through here and how she's begging for the support here. We had someone else that, um, there was a veteran actually that went through an alarming situation <laughs> himself. And then we had another um, family here, that uh, single mom with a couple of kids going through different situations, both because the, either the record was not sealed and there was discrepancies in it, so they were denied housing, or in another instance where the new landlord comes in, changes the rent by several hundred dollars, and uh, the people are, f are forced out of where they, they live. And I also want to mention, too, that the services provided by the Justice Center also include uh, to, um, you know, facing eviction, defense clinic that's held free every Thursday from 1 to 3 at 62 Main Street. And I think that's, that's important to note. So um, I'm just hoping that my colleagues get on board with this. And I want to thank you, Laura, for being here this evening. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Yes. Councillor McGeary. Second. Councillor McGeary. My other question is, you, know, you, you gave us the overview of the two, two uh, bills that are in. Do either of those specifically state, you know, put into words to, to remove minors' names off of these documents? Yes. Um, that's, you know, obviously that, that's, to me, that's the most critical thing out of all of it, is it, you shouldn't have children's names floating around. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, the both the uh, House and Senate bills regarding <coughs> sealing of eviction records have explicit language that it would amend Mass General Law 186 to include a provision that would make it unlawful to name a minor in an eviction action. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I just have any a council of Castro, please. Thank you. Um, I will vote to support this. The uh, article in yesterday's newspaper that my colleague refer uh, referenced. It was taking place in the 800 block of Main Street, which is in Ward 4, my ward. Thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. I, I used to be the chief counsel for Joint Committee on Election Laws. So um, in terms of sessions, was this filed in this current session or was it a refile? It was a refile. So how many times had it been filed? Uh, this is the second filing. Second filing. And we actually- oh, for both. For, okay. Be we actually <laughs> have the privilege of having um, one of our state reps, Claire Corner, who's chairwoman of the judiciary. Do you know? Do you know where she stands on this? So it's Rep. Cronin's position not to publicly endorse uh, any bills that are going Pending to be before, before her. her committee. Okay. We have had conversations. Okay. Um, nope. That's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. Favorable. Back to the council. All in favor, kindly raise your hand. All opposed, that carries. Thank you for your thank, time thank tonight. You. Thank you so much. Go on to the last agenda item, please. Resolve to invite Mr. Robert Jenkins, in his capacity as Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, BRA, to represent, sorry, to present to the City Council updated information on the BRA's construction of the municipal parking garage, including the construction schedule, budget, and currently expected completion date, and any other related information. Invited Robert Jenkins, Executive Director, Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Robert May, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Good evening, Mr. Jenkins. Good evening, Councillors. Before we start, I just want to say at the NAACP 65th Annual Gala that was the other night, was Mr. Jenkins was the best dressed. <laughs> <laughs> he really was. The tux with the gold, you, fantastic, <laughs> Robert. Fantastic. Wow. Excuse me, point of information, I believe Mr. Reto would be uh, would argue that. Well, his shoes were better. <laughs> thank you for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Councillors, for inviting me. Um, I think this was Councillor Nicastro's. Yes. That's all. I appreciate coming. I'm going to make this short and sweet. We're on budget. We're on schedule. Yes. And I think everyone has an invitation to the dedication yep. on December 5th. Any questions? <laughs> Motion recommend favorably. Second. Second. No, no, no. It's constantly cash. Yes. 
um, on the motion. Thank you for coming this evening, Mr. Jenkins, and for waiting uh, such a long time on you as well. Mr. May, at the time that we approved the financing for the, for the garage, we had talked about having you back in every three months or so, and we were remiss in inviting you within three months or so. And so I just wanted you to come in. I had heard some different things and wanted you to come in and sure. you know, tell us. And that's part of my responsibility as, as well. And I was remiss in not keeping in contact with all the council members. Matter of fact, before I got the resolve, I was talking to Council Farwell and it just so happens he called me and I said, it's funny because I was thinking about you and if someone would br send, bring me to the council just so that I can report. As you, I, some of you, I've handed out a budget. I didn't have <clears throat> 11. I think I only had 10 because I lost <laughs> my chairman, Phil who, uh, Griffin, who actually has to get up in the morning and go to work around 3 a.m. So he actually left with one of my copies. But as you can see in the budget, and I have, I also want to recognize Bob Malley. Where's Mr. Yay. Uh, he switched over. <clears throat> and also um, Andrea from uh, Pink, yes. who's also here as well. <laughs> Just to go through this really quickly, you can see that there was a, a, a grand total of $17 million, $10 million from the state, $2 million a bond from the city, $5 million bond from the city. We are well within, um, as I said earlier, our budget. As a matter of fact, we're under budget. Um, we're 90% done with the garage. Um, it's good that Brent Warren also stuck around because I've been trying to reach him for the last two weeks. And right now he's not on my hours, so I don't know who's he here with, but he has to tell me, how do I transfer this back to the city? And I'm looking at the end of December, the first of the year of transferring this asset back to the city of, Bo city of Brockton through the council. Um, if you have any other questions, as I said earlier, when you, when you charge the redevelopment authority with redeveloping or developing the garage, I have never done this before. Um, now I can say that I do have some experience. Um, needless to say, the planning department, specifically Pam Gurley, gave me some, she gave me a lot of, how should I say, not so sleepless nights. When you're dealing with a $17 million budget, um, the first part is real easy, but when you get to 50, 75% and you start watching those dollars, yes, I did not sleep some nights. But Pam, <laughs> lovely Pam, I have to give her a lot of uh, kudos here, made it easy for me to sleep because not only did we have the consultant, the BRA, but the planning department watching our dollars and making sure that we stayed on budget. If you go through this, if you have any budgetary questions, I can answer them today for you. As I said, I'm looking to turn this back over to the city council end of December, first of the year. It's your asset. Councilor Castro, any follow ups? So no, nope, I'm all set. Thank, thank you, you. Council for Silent. Council Mr. Powell. Mr. Jenkins confided in, he, in me that he is heartbroken that we haven't had him here more often and last on the agenda. So we'll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but, but, as I but said, the I'll... serious, you know, the, the human side of this is yes. I have never seen this man raise his voice. I have no idea how they do that. I don't know whether it's a family trait or <laughs> you are one of the most well. even keeled individuals that I have ever met. And I must say it's, 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 it's inspiring to those of us who sometimes get our passions ramped up. But I swear if the whole building fell down around us, you'd say, well, now when we're going to down, go down the stairs and we're going to make it out. And I so, always look uh, at the glasses yeah, half full. And that's full. a compliment. That's, that's <laughs> Thank a compliment you. To Thank you, you Councillor. I appreciate it. Yeah. Any other council? Council Cruz, please. Just a comment also, Mr. Jenkins in your department, Mr. May in your department, and Mr. Malley and your people, on time and under budget. Can you do the rest of the city for us and we'll be all set? <laughs> so thank you. It, it's it's Appreciate great. It. Thanks for staying so late at night to keep us, to give us some good news uh, for a change. But we'll, that's great. We'll see you on the fi uh, 5th, right? The 5th of December. Great. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's um, a motion that was made. It was seconded. It's a favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you oppose, raise your hand. It passes favorable. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Jenkins, you. Mr. May, Mr. Malley. Thank you. Um, councils, again, I, I said it kind of briefly, but um, we anticipate to have the tax classification hearing Monday, December 2nd, 6.30 p.m. here in the chamber. Okay, it'll be duly noticed and all that stuff. But if you could just note that in your, 
calendars and for our new colleagues, you, you want to be here as well. It's an interesting endeavor. Um, anything else before us tonight? Mr. Chairman, just a reminder to ordinance, 6 p.m. Wednesday. This Wednesday, ordinance committee will meet here. Thank you. Thank you. Council Monaghan, please. Uh, yes, just a moment of personal privilege. Of course. Uh, I just want to th uh, thank everybody. Uh, it's been a month. It's my first meeting back since my son passed away. And I uh, just want to thank everybody for reaching out to me, especially my colleagues on the council. And um, <clears throat> I think I uh, recall Council Cruz, I watched that meeting, uh, saying that uh, Council Sullivan was Timmy's favorite council. And like you did mention, he had a little poor judgment there. But... <laughs> He did, his nickname for him was General Patton for some reason. <laughs> Keep slamming that gavel down. But he did say one day that he hoped he would be the mayor. And so I'm glad you are the mayor and I hope you make him proud. Thank of you. you. Thank you. Thanks for being back. <laughs> Anything else before us? Seeing none, safe travels. Good night. <laughs>